Next, national drug control policy. Lee Brown, who heads up that office, reviews his agency's work and explains this year's goals. Congressman Martin Zeloff chairs Thursday's subcommittee hearing. Subcommittee on National Security, International Affairs, and Criminal Justice will now come to order. This hearing is to continue our review of the President's National Drug Control Strategy and to evaluate the, strat the status of the drug war. Before swearing in the witness and recognizing members for questions, the Chair would like to welcome Dr. Lee Brown, President Clinton's Director of the Office of Drug Control Policy. Welcome, Dr. Brown. Dr. Brown is here in continuation of the hearing that began on March 9th when he appeared along with First Lady Na Nancy Reagan, former drug czar William Bennett, former DEA head Robert Bonner, and other distinguished drug policy experts. Dr. Brown, it's a pleasure to have you here today, and we thank you very much for uh, coming back and resuming uh, questions and, and adding, I guess, uh, additional testimony on this very, very important subject. Um, as is the custom of this committee, we appreciate the opportunity to swear you in. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that testimony you're about to give the subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Let the record show that the witness responded in the affirmative. The uh, way we're going to uh, do this uh, in discussion with minority uh, the hearing will be concluding at 10.30 this morning. The chair will recognize each member for uh, five minutes of questioning. Uh, once all members have had the opportunity for their questions, the chair will recognize members for a second round of questioning. Uh, we will hold opening statements uh, to the chair, the ranking member, the committee chair, and the committee ranking member. And all other members will be given an opportunity to include their statements in the record. Without objection, so ordered. In our hearing on March 9th, featuring Mrs. Reagan, we began the process of evaluating both the national drug control strategy and where we stand in the drug war. As we noted on that day, nationwide surveys clearly show that over the past two years, something very, very formidable and frightening has begun to happen. Drug use is again rising steeply, especially among the nation's children, reversing a decade-long downward trend. More kids are able to afford, and more kids are today using, highly potent, dangerous drugs, including heroin, crack, cocaine, LSD, inhalants, stimulants, and marijuana. Surveys done in 1993 and 1994 show that for every grade level surveyed and for every drug that I just mentioned, use is up. This is a first for casual use, and it delivers an ominous message. Our nation is more at risk than most people realize, and is very dangerous. That is why, Dr. Brown, we have brought you here again today, and your offer to attend on the second hearing is very much appreciated, to talk about this problem, to start thinking about ways to reverse this great tragedy. Since our first hearing, some outstanding articles have been written on the exploding drug problem. In one article, a prominent journalist came forward to discuss his battle with heroin. Over the past two weeks, the Washington Post carried an excellent series of articles describing the brutal infiltration by Colombia's Cali drug cartel in our own society. Quoting one of these articles, the paper wrote, and I quote, the Cali cartel is increasingly using violence to protect its lucrative U.S. cocaine market. They are trying to do things in this country similar to what they do in Colombia. This week, the Post carried another story, similar to stories that have appeared in Los Angeles Times, New York Times, and Dallas Morning News recently. The Post zeroed in on Mexico and the newly powerful Mexico, Mexican drug cartels. The Post article, and I quote, uh, mentions what makes the expanding role of Mexico in drug trafficking especially dangerous is that the fight in Colombia, home of the most powerful cocaine cartels is widely viewed as being lost. What we are learning, among other things, is that the administration's open reduction of drug and addiction, its reduced emphasis on drug-related financial crimes, 
its shift of precious resources into treatment of hardcore addicts and its willingness to tolerate unaccountable, unvalidated and often ineffective prevention programs is getting us nowhere. In fact, as internal documents indicate, it is now threatening our nation's national security. Since the last hearing, our officials have been uh, our, well, our officials and our offices have been flooded with letters and calls from parents, citizen groups, school teachers, police officers, and many people that are involved in the drug war and others, saying that they think that we need to get our nation back on track and we need to get on with a, a much more effective effort. We cannot become a nation beholden to violent drug lords, whether it's Colombian, Mexican, or North American. We cannot become a nation satisfied to watch Hollywood glorify drugs, watch more kids using drugs each year. We've got to find and pursue a strategy that will work. So Dr. Brown, we turn to you. We have a, some limited time today to level with each other, to send a message that we need to return to strong interdiction, strong anti-drug financial crimes enforcement, strong validated accountable prevention and education programs, and we need presidential leadership, your leadership, our leadership, our nation's leadership, and everyone if we're ever going to win this drug war. With these commitments, I'm confident that we can regain control, work together to frame a strategy that will work and turn back the tide of illegal drug use and cartel-driven violence. Without these commitments, I'm equally convinced that our national security is increasingly at risk. I look forward to a frank dialogue today, but I also want to thank you again for coming to discuss a very tough problem at a very tough time. Your job's not easy, and I think most of us appreciate that. Again, we welcome you, and we look forward to your testimony. The chair now recognizes the ranking minority member, my good friend Karen Thurman of Florida, for opening statement. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, and I will be brief. First, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your continuing commitment to this important issue and for holding this series of hearings. Let me reiterate that I intend to work with you and the other members of the subcommittee in a nonpartisan and constructive manner to help find solutions to the drug problem facing our country. I also want to welcome Dr. Lee Brown. We do appreciate you for coming in early this morning and giving as much time as you have, and we look forward to hearing more of your insights. As our first hearing on March 9th clearly indicated that drugs remained a serious problem among our nation's youth. While we will continue to debate the merits of policies such as prevention efforts versus interdiction strategies, let me join with Chairman Zeliff and pledge my full support to you, Dr. Brown, and offer my assistance that I can provide. This subcommittee's mission should be to work together with the administration in providing that assistance and to find those solutions that work. And I just again want to thank you very much for being here um, and look forward to your remarks today. Thank you. We'd like to uh, start the uh, testimony, Dr. Brown. Uh, your full testimony will be included in the record, but uh, if you'd like to summarize or anything you'd like to start out with. Thank you and good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to appear before the committee once again, and I'm glad to be able to accommodate the chairman's time constraints so we can be here at 8 o'clock in the morning. It's my understanding that today's hearing is actually a continuation of the subcommittee hearing held on Thursday, March 9th, at which time I testified about the President's 1995 National Drug Control Strategy, which was released on the 8th of February. Unfortunately, at that time, there was insufficient opportunity for the members of the subcommittee to ask all of their questions. As you know, Mr. Chairman, I have not prepared separate testimony for today's hearing, but I'm delighted to be here today to respond to all of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. We uh, left off uh, in, in terms of uh, your testimony and the questions uh, on the last hearing with a, uh, an unclassified letter dated December 1st, 1994 from Admiral Kramick, the U.S. Coast Guard Commandant and President Clinton's interdiction coordinator. It was a letter to you as drug czar, and uh, it dealt with the adequacy of interdiction resources. Do you recall that letter? Uh, yes, sir, I do. And we provided you with another copy today, I believe. I have a copy of it. Okay. Um, I guess before we get into other areas, I'd like to focus on that letter. On March 3rd, four days before we met in my office and six days before our last hearing, 
I asked you in a hand-delivered uh, letter to bring with you, uh, and I quote, any communications received by you from the administration's interdiction coordinator regarding the adequacy of interdiction resources, unquote. Do you recall receiving that request? Yes, I do. And well, I guess one of the questions that we had, because it's, it's relative to how many other letters are out there, um, we were a little concerned that you did not provide us with this information, it was unclassified, um, did not recognize or indicate any reference to it. And I'm just wondering why we had to get it from another source. Mr. Chairman, there's a reason for that. This letter was attached to a classified document. As I indicated, I'd be delighted to have given you a, a classified briefing on the issue. That's the reason you did not receive this document. To my knowledge, all the unclassified information we had at our disposal was provided for you. But again, the reason this was not supplied was because it was attached to a classified document. Right. We understand that the attachments were, uh, were classified, the letter was not. And that was the only question that we had is why we had to dig so hard to get it. I guess my question would be, are there any other letters that are pertinent and that we should receive as well that are very similar? To my knowledge, uh, we provided you with all that you asked for. On the letter itself, um, it refers to the conference, um, and I'll just ask you, the conference on October 25th, were you at that conference? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. Okay. Uh, the con that letter refers to the conference that was uh, held on October 25th. That is correct. I assume you were. All right. Um, Admiral Kramick stated, and I quote, I reaffirm my conclusion that we need to restore assets to the interdiction force structure, unquote. You're, you're familiar with the yes, contents of that. What what was your feeling uh, after being, being there at that conference uh, and then the follow-up letter from the Admiral uh, relative to the content in that letter? Let, let me try to put it in context. One of my responsibilities is to coordinate on behalf of the President this country's counter-narcotics efforts. Uh, the President issued uh, Presidential Decision Directive 14 in that directive, he authorized me to be able to appoint an interdiction coordinator. Uh, I, I chose to appoint the Commandant of the Coast Guard uh, for a variety of reasons. The most important, that the, 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 the Commandant is very competent in addressing the issue, I have great confidence in his ability. Admiral Kramick's doing an outstanding job. He and I co-hosted the conference. Uh, we worked together to bring together the irrelevant players in the interdiction effort to determine what we need to do. We, we had a very productive conference. He is carrying out his responsibility. He is responsible for looking at the threat of interdiction, uh, for interdiction purposes, and making sure that our assets are in the correct place. So he's doing his job, and he submitted to me a recommendation based upon that. His responsibility, however, differs somewhat from mine. Uh, for example, if we had a person who was responsible only for prevention, they would focus only on the preventive aspect. Someone's responsible only for law enforcement would, would recommend to me issues dealing with only law enforcement. I have responsibility for the totality of this nation's counter-narcotics efforts, starting with enforcement, prevention, education, treatment, uh, our interdiction efforts, as well as our international efforts. I point that out because I have to look at the issues uh, comprehensively and making sure that we have a balanced approach to address the counter-narcotics problem in this country. And so there are no surprises in his uh, correspondence to me. Uh, the, the Admiral and I talk on a regular basis. We meet and, as I said before, have great confidence in what he's doing. He's doing a great job for this country. He, uh, he certainly uh, has got a great reputation and, and it's no, uh, no intent on my part to discredit that and do anything but to compliment uh, the great job that he is doing. Um, but based on the letter and based on the consensus of agency heads um, during the conference, um, apparently there's indication in that letter that says that we must return to 1992-93 levels of effort on interdiction in terms of assets, uh, restoring assets to the interdiction force structure. The question would be, uh, 
what was done with that request. I think he be I believe the letter refers to the fact that he asked you to bring it to the attention of the president. And I'm just curious of, of what was done. What I think is important in looking at all aspects of our counter narcotics efforts is to make, make sure that our funds are spent in the most cost effective way. Uh, to say we want to return to a specific level like 92, 93 does not provide me with the appropriate information upon which to make decisions. Uh, for example, during that time frame, uh, this nation was purchasing a great deal of equipment, uh, our capital investments. And as a result of that, those assets are now in place. So it would not be necessary to have a budget at this time that's predicated upon an investment in our airplanes and helicopters and other equipment to address the issue. So where are we now? I'm working with the interdiction coordinator to do a complete assessment of our interdiction efforts. By that I mean taking a look at what is the threat as we see it today, what are the resources we have to address the threat, and what is the void. And then once we come to a conclusion about what we need, then we can make some decisions based upon what other resources are necessary to carry out this nation's interdiction program. So on December 1st, he wrote you a letter requesting a return to the previous assets of 92-93, ask you to bring this to the attention of the President. This is a consensus of all agency heads. You apparently made a decision yourself not to do that, and you are now, several months later, addressing whether, in fact, that request was justified? I'm in the process of working with the Commandant to determine exactly what we need based upon a complete assessment of the drug threat to this country. What are we doing to address that threat through all of our resources and then making a determination as to what are the budgetary implications of that. Okay. Did you ever bring it to the attention of the President in terms of reviewing what happened on October 25th meeting and very specifically the request from Admiral Kramer? The specific request was never given to the President, but I do meet with the President and speak with the President on a regular basis about the drug issue. In fact, the President has been uh, very much up front in addressing this issue, talking with all elements of our counter-narcotics effort, military and others, and engaging them in addressing the drug issue. So Again, you had I repeat a, you, the answer to my question is that what we're doing right now is taking a look at our interdiction efforts, what strategies are used by the drug trafficking organizations, what are we doing in response to that, and coming up with something I think you would appreciate also is making sure that our resources are used in a manner where we get the most from the efforts that we put forth. I think that's the reasonable thing to do, and I consider that to be one of my responsibilities. October 25th was about six months ago, and apparently all agency heads <clears throat> certainly put up the caution alarm, if not the, the, the cry for help. Um, you elected not, not to present this message to the President, um, we're now six months later and we're reviewing whether in fact uh, the, the consensus at that point was legitimate and do we really need additional interdiction efforts? Is that, am I understanding what you just... Well, I'll try to clarify so there will be no need to guess about what I'm saying. Maybe repeating myself in some respect, but we did co-sponsor a conference bringing together the appropriate actors in our interdiction efforts. We looked at what we're doing. We looked at the threat. As a result of that, the Commandant did send me the letter which you make reference to. The letter suggests we go back to a certain point in time and fund our interdiction efforts at that level. Now, my response was that we need to take a look at our budget. I think the Commandant would point out very, very vividly himself that he supports the policy that we have for interdiction in this country. He supports a presidential decision directed number 14 calling for the controlled shift to the source countries. He supports the efforts to take a careful look at what we're doing to make sure we use our resources in the most cost-effective way. 
And what we're doing right now is working with the, with the interdiction coordinator to make sure that we have a clear understanding as to what do we really need and not taking an arbitrary point in time where the budget may have been at one of its highest levels and being at a higher level basically because this nation was purchasing the necessary capital ex equipment to carry out the job. Could be helicopters, vessels, aircraft. Uh, we have those things in place right now. So what we need to do is determine what do we need to do to fill whatever void exists in helping us carry out the policy of this country to deal with interdiction. Um, isn't it true that during the last three years President Clinton has overseen cuts in drug interdiction budget of more than 12.3 percent? And let me just refer you to Admiral Kramick's paragraph 4, and I quote, this would properly place drug interdiction and counter drug programs as a whole in the context of the most serious threats to the American people and our national security, unquote. Admiral Kramick was communicating his view that the administration's reduced drug interdiction effort poses a serious threat to the American people and our national security. Isn't that true? I think it would be not true to suggest that the President has cut the budget. As you know, the President requests and the Congress has the responsibility to appropriate. If we look at what happened in fiscal year 1994, the Congress cut the Department of Defense budget by some $300 million. This is occurring at the same time that a policy change took place where the decision was made based upon an eight-month study by the National Security Council to make a controlled shift. I use the word control because we use the word control in setting that policy from interdiction in the transit zone to greater efforts in the source country. Now, why would we do that? When we first started the counter-narcotics effort in this country, the drug trafficking organizations were sending their drugs over in general aviation. We used the military, used Coast Guard, we used all of our resources, and we made a difference. They changed their strategy. And because they changed their strategy, it's incumbent on us to change our strategy. This was not an arbitrary decision. This was a decision made after about eight months of study of this issue by the National Security Council, which involves an interagency effort. Now, once we made the policy change, Congress got ahead of the policy by cutting the Department of Defense budget by some $300 million. Thus, we have a good policy calling for a shift, but nothing to shift. At the same time, we wanted to place a greater emphasis in the source countries. But at the same time, the Congress cut State Department's budget by some $200 million. So what do we end up with? We end up with a policy that calls for a shift in interdiction from the transit zone to the source countries, but a half a billion dollars cut in our interdiction budget. And thus, the policy is still the right, a good policy, but we do not have the resources that we requested to carry out that policy. I just, uh, before I turn it over to Mrs. Thurman, uh, I guess my concern would be if the President had the drug issue on the front burner and it was one of his major considerations in terms of his leadership, and there was a meeting on October 25th of all agency heads that you were co-hosting with Admiral Kramick. And I guess I would probably want to be informed of the fact that my interdiction uh, coordinator uh, is asking for some resources, a return to 1992-93 levels, and is raising some red flags in terms of his ability to get the job done. My guess is that somehow I would have wanted that communicated to me. Um, and, and it concerns me that six months later we're finally starting to take a look at that. But uh, Can I answer that, Mr. No. Chairman? It, it would be inaccurate to assume that I am not communicating to the President on this issue. The President is very much concerned about what goes on in the drug issue, and we talk on a regular basis. I think you could appreciate that if you were in my position, you would not take an issue to the President without having the backup material to justify your request. I think that's incumbent upon me to do that, do that, and I will not do otherwise. I'll make sure that I have the adequate information to present to the President prior to making any recommendations. And we also, as you know, have a process for addressing the budget issue. It's called the budget process, where we will present before the President any issue that's appropriate to address the issue. In fact, <clears throat> the President has allowed me to do something that's unprecedented in my office, that is to sit with him uh, when he hears the appeals from the various agencies on their budget. 
I sit down with uh, OMB when they address the, the budget issues. So I'm very much involved in it. I, cons I consider it to be my professional responsibility in this position to make sure I have the facts before I present a proposal to the President. Well, again, on October 25th, you certainly had the opportunity with every agency head there and a consensus of all agency heads to move forward. Um, I, I am glad that you're going back through it, and I hope maybe these hearings are, are helpful. Um, but my concern is, is we're not moving fast enough. Uh, Mrs. Thurman. Thank you, Mr. Um, Dr. Brown, how do you answer the assertion that source countries are merely taking U.S. aid without making any significant efforts to stop the drug trade? We'd have to look at country by country. If we, I've had a chance to travel uh, in, in the source countries and also the transit countries, starting with Mexico, for example. Uh, Mexico has done a great deal in taking over the counter narcotics efforts themselves. At one time, we were investing a considerable amount of money, millions of dollars, in Mexico. But they, they've taken over the initiative and they're addressing it themselves. They have a lot more to do. And we're working with them to achieve the objective because some 70 percent of the cocaine that comes into the United States come through Mexico. So we're very concerned. Panama was a great uh, major transit money laundering uh, country. They've enacted legislation to help address the money laundering issue there. I visited with their re their officials to ensure that they're doing what's appropriate to address the problem. Colombia, uh, as you know, that's where the major cartels, the cartels are. And uh, we've had a chance to meet with their officials, including the president, to ensure from our benefit that they are addressing the issue. Uh, the same thing is true with Peru. I think Peru is on the way to be much more aggressive in eradicating the, the, the coca leaf that's grown there. I met recently with Bolivia. Uh, they've done a good job except in the area er eradication. Now they're moving forward on that. So we have to look at it country by country. And that's, that's what the certification process is about, where the President will certify to the Congress that those countries are doing or not doing a good job in addressing the, the, the narcotics issue in their country. Thank you. Um, so what you're telling me, we are making some of these diplomatic overtures. We're trying to work with these countries to... Most certainly. If you, if you recall, just a few months ago, the President hosted the heads of some 33 uh, countries in this hemisphere at the Miami summit. And out of that came a declaration of principles. And one of the major declaration of principles dealt with the narcotics effort because all of us in this hemisphere recognize that the narcotic problem does pose a threat to this entire hemisphere. It's not just Amer an American problem. This is a global problem and it's recognized by those countries because a country may start off as a, as a growth country, production country, a transit country, that country soon becomes also a consumer country. So it's in their best interest also to address the drug problem. Dr. Brown, are these not some of the same continuation of what had been uh, strategies from at previous administrations? I mean, are we not doing some of those same things? Or if we aren't, what are the differences that we're doing? There are some things and also some policy differences. Uh, as would be expected, because you have a change in administration, the problem doesn't change, and therefore, overnight, the, the, the process of the, some 50 federal agencies addressing the narcotics issue in this administration or this country will not change. In enforcement, for example, the, the kingpin st strategy, the linear strategy, is still being carried on by this administration, uh, working with sustained economic development, sustained democracy, those are very important issues. Uh, looking at the issue of institution building, those, those are carry, uh, issues that are being carried on. The major policy difference we've implemented under the Clinton administration is the policy to change from a less than effective interdiction effort in the transit zone and place a greater emphasis in the source countries. If I could use that as an analogy, if we're concerned about harness going throughout a community, they were better off going to the harness nest and stopping them there rather than waiting until they spread throughout the community and try to grab them one by one. The same thing is being done in our interdiction strategy. We're better off going to the source of the drugs because we, we're more able to stop them there than waiting until the drugs leave the country and then spread themselves throughout our vast air, water, and land borders. You, you mentioned Peru and, and some of the others, um, and, it, and it's my understanding that the drug trafficking 
um, is estimated to infuse about a billion dollars into their economy. Um, in Bolivia, the coca industry is estimated to generate about 10 to 15 percent of the GNP. What steps has the Clinton administration taken to address the root economic causes of cocoa cultivation? There's no one answer. We have a number of initiatives that we have going in, let's take Bolivia as an example, because I've visited Bolivia and had a chance to, Bolivia and had a chance to look at what they're doing. Um, providing those countries with alternative means of making a living is a big part of what we're trying to do, sustain economic development. And I point that out because we're not going to solve that problem overnight. We're going to have to have from this country, this Congress, and any administration a sustained commitment over a period of time. Uh, in Bolivia, for example, they've used uh, the coca leaf for years. In fact, about one-third is used for legitimate legal purposes in their country for things like cocoa tea and toothpaste and chewing gum and things like that. Uh, but we have to also not lose sight of that we're talking about developing nations. And so as we develop the ability to provide an opportunity, them, opportunity for them to get out of the cocoa growth business, there must be other opportunities. I visited, for example, a banana of uh, plantation that we, we helped establish there. And I talked to the farmers there, and they were much more pleased to be able to be farming and bananas and cocoa leaf. They, but we have to also look at their infrastructure. They do not have the roads that we have to get their products to the market. The drug trafficking organizations will fly in and get the cocoa leaf, where the banana uh, 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 marketing people will not do that. So we have to look at it in that context. We have to have a sustained effort to ensure that there is a sustained economic development while at the same time reforming their institutions, their judicial system, their police, at the same time making sure that democracy is sustained in those countries, making sure that all the things that are necessary for a stable nation to be in place. That's the commitment we must have over a period of time, not a one year, not a two year, but a long term commitment to work with them in addressing this issue. Dr. Brown. With that, and are we then now working with our Eastern Bloc countries to assure that they don't get into this drug trafficking that we've seen in other areas? As what I, are we doing? As I briefly alluded to, this is really an issue that's global in nature. Uh, the major threat to this country at this time is still cocaine coming from our neighbors to the, to the south of us. Uh, heroin is also a major concern. Uh, heroin is a, a big problem in many of our European countries. So yes, we are concerned about the former Soviet bloc nations and the drug trafficking that comes through those countries. Uh, we are working with them. Uh, many of our officials in the administration have gone to Europe to meet with them. We're working through the United Nations. My belief is that we have to approach it on, on several levels. Number one, we must have bilateral relationships with the countries of concern to us. By the same token, we must have a regional approach. And looking at what we need to do in this hemisphere for cocaine is a very important part of what we're doing. That's what the, the Miami summit was all about, to give us the, the mechanism of doing that. And I might add that that was not the first summit we've had on the drug issue or a summit that dealt with the drug issue. So it's a continuation of things that have taken place over a period of years. Then if we look at the, the threat of heroin, we're concerned more about uh, countries in Asia, uh, particularly South, uh, uh, Southeast Asia and Southwest Asia. And so, the United Nations also play a very important part through their uh, narcotics program. My point being that we have to look at it at different levels, uh, bilateral relationships, regional relationships, as well as through the United Nations on a global effort. Um, to move on just to a, a, a little bit of a different but kind of related. Um, the Customs Service has been criticized. Um, for poor interdiction efforts on the southwest border. And additionally, there have been allegations of corruption among custom inspectors. Uh, is there any substance to these allegations? As could be expected, any allegation alleging misconduct is being investigated. And the investigation is designed to determine if there is validity to any allegation made against the customs official. That's, that's kind of the, the normal course of business. You know, I come from a police background, right. and any time there's an allegation of misconduct on the part of a police officer, we have in place mechanisms to, to do that investigation. By the same token, I have recently visited the southwest border one trip with the customs commissioner. 
to take a look at what we're doing there because we are very much concerned about the drugs coming across the border into the United States from Mexico. And we announced a, a, a program that we call Operation Hardline, where we're adding more customs agents to the border. We're using technology to assist us in our interdiction efforts, and we expect to make a difference. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you, Mrs. Thurman. Um, I'd like to now recognize uh, someone who's been very, very patient, did not have a chance to ask any questions. I believe we ended up with uh, John Shattuck from Arizona, uh, a colleague from Arizona. John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I commend you for these hearings. Dr. Brown, I appreciate your coming back so that we could uh, pursue these issues. I I've got to begin by laying a little bit of foundation here. Um, I have a 13-year-old daughter and a 9-year-old son. I consider myself right on the edge personally of these problems. Uh, and I live in Arizona. Uh, you've just made some remarks about uh, Operation Hardline and your efforts on the bo southwestern border of the United States. That concerns me gravely. I have to say, as a freshman, I am frustrated by this process. I think I would rather sit down and have a conversation with you at length uh, in your office or in our living, some living room where we could get into some of these issues because I find a huge gulf between what you are saying here and some of the evidence that we see and some of the testimony of some of the other witnesses that we've heard. And it, and it bothers me deeply. And it's not that I want to make partisan issues here. It's that I want to find out what we're doing. And I'd like, I think, to hopefully persuade you that some of the things that we're doing aren't working. Um, just, just now, uh, a minute ago in the testimony that you were just giving, you talked about more heavily relying on Mexican officials to deal with these issues in their nation. I will tell you, that scares me to death. Um, in September of last year, a Phoenix police officer was murdered. Uh, we have, the gentleman that committed the murder fled to Mexico. The Phoenix Police Department and the Phoenix Police Law Enforcement Officers Association clearly want to capture this man. He has gone to Mexico. The police department and the law enforcement officers, the Phoenix police officers, have come to my office and to every other congressman's office from Arizona and laid out this case. They know where he is. They know Mexican officials who know where he is. They've gone to them and said they want cooperation to go and get him. And they've been told point blank by officials of Mexico, we will not assist you. He is deeply involved and, and highly placed in drug trafficking in Mexico, production and trafficking, and we simply will not cooperate in any way. That says to me that a strategy which relies more heavily on Mexico, as you've just outlined, is a disaster. Do you have a response to that? Sure. First of all, I'm a father also. I've raised four children. I'm a grandfather of six children. In addition to that, I have some 30 years in law enforcement. So I've seen the problem from many perspectives. And so I come to you, you from that perspective as a father, grandfather, but also someone who started a career at, as an undercover narcotics officer and have the opportunity to be, be in charge of major police departments, Atlanta, Houston, and the largest police agent, agency in this country, New York City. That's my perspective. So I'm very much concerned about what goes on from that perspective. You raise questions about whether this should be a partisan issue. I look forward to sitting down with you. I'll contact your office and set up the time to do so, because I strongly believe we cannot make the drug issue and the byproducts of crime and violence a democratic issue, a Republican issue, or an independent issue. This is an American crisis that we have to work on together. And I'm delighted to hear that you agree with specific me on that. Concern I have, <clears throat> the specific concern I have is that your testimony just indicated that we're relying more heavily now. Our policy, you just said, is to rely more heavily on the officials in Mexico to deal with this problem in Mexico. And I've just outlined current evidence that those officials don't want to help us. Uh, that, that, does that concern you? Well, I am concerned with the totality of the drug problem. Uh, we have had uh, numerous meetings with the Mexican officials. If you listen to their newly elected president, he has indicated he's very much concerned about a number of issues, not only the narcotics issue, but also the corruption problem. Just recently, I met with the attorney general, general who, for example, was appointed from the opposition party, party, which gives some indication that they're attempting to move ahead on the issue. Uh, when I indicated that we have a, a new strategy, we want to place a greater emphasis in the source countries uh, that relates to what we think must be done. Uh, the Mexican government is relying more on its own resources. We're working with them because much of the drugs that come to this country, come into this country, come through Mexico. And so we have to rely on them as an ally in addressing the drug problem. But we, just as they are, are concerned about some of the problems. We have to understand very clearly that narcotics 
industry, drug trafficking, it's big business. Billions of dollars involved in this industry. And as a result, it corrupts. It corrupts officials in every country where we have a serious drug problem. Mexico is no exception to that. So we are working with them. We have to rely on them as being a very important ally. Uh, our State Department has, has sent its uh, uh, deputy who was in charge of the narcotics problem to Mexico on one occasion, uh, more than one occasion. The President has sent a message there himself. I have written to the President on a couple occasions about this problem. So we are engaging Mexico in a very aggressive way let to me, address let me ask the problem. A specific question. Isn't it true that we offered the Mexican President use of our Black Hawk helicopters for this issue, and he refused them? The use of equipment that we have in our possession has been offered to the Mexican government. We're still working with them to see if we can assist them in any way. So we are offering our services. Keep it in mind that so at one not, but time... But they're not using them now. Keep in mind that one time uh, the Mexican government felt that they could carry out their responsibilities without, without any equipment from the United States. Look. Now we're reassessing that decision and we're looking at being of any help we can. I hope they'll reassess it, but I hope we'll reassess any reduction of our own effort inside Mexico, but I simply don't believe they'll deal with the problem effectively when they tell the Phoenix law enforcement officers, sorry, we will not help you get a murderer back. You mentioned source countries and that your introduction efforts now, and I think this perhaps is a change in policy, <clears throat> are, focused, are focused on source countries. That testimony conflicts 100 degrees, it's polar extremes with the testimony we got last year, last hearing regarding the efforts at interdiction, regarding a kingpin strategy. What evidence can you give me in terms of hard numbers in your budget that we are in fact going after the source countries and have a kingpin strategy? I'm not sure what the question you're asking. What evidence can I give you that can we have a strategy? A, what evidence can you give me that in fact we are focusing our efforts now in a meaningful way on interdiction in the source countries? I can tell you that the kingpin strategy, our linear strategy, has not changed. Contrary to what anyone else may tell you, I sit in this position. I know what's going on day after day after day. Someone who may have sat in this chair some years ago do not know what's going on day after day after day. Now, what evidence you're asking for, I'll be delighted to provide any information you want to tell you what our strategy well, is. How about, can you cite to me specific conversations between the President and the President of Colombia or some other source nation where, where our President has placed this as a top priority and enlisted their help and gotten it? The President has corresponded with the President of Mexico. Uh, he's corresponded with the other President of the countries. And almost in every instance, the issue of narcotics comes up. Why? Because it's a major problem, not just for the United States, it's a problem for their countries as well. Just recently, I know... I'm glad it comes up, but has he ever sought them out to discuss this issue, and can you give this committee some, te some evidence of that fact? I'll provide whatever this committee would like to have. If you're asking for specific dates, we will come back with you and give you what information you're asking for. Could I just jump in and ask a quick question? It sounds like what you're saying in, in answer to some of these questions, that the interdiction strategy is working and you obviously must feel that way uh, we sure have indication that it is not uh, we have the, uh, the the commandant of the Coast Guard that's asking for more resources he's referred to the fact that the interdiction strategy needs help and it's not working um, you're sounding like you're willing to commit to the fact that it is now it, can you give us some evidence that it is what I'm telling you is we have the right strategy you have we, the right strategy, the correct strategy, an adequate which, strategy. Which is centered on treatment. We're talking about interdiction right now, aren't we? Well, that's, that's right. right. But the let, right me, strategy. let me respond to the question and I'll give you an answer. Okay. Yeah. As I indicated before, the President issued Presidential Decision Directive 14. That directive called for a controlled shift from interdiction in the transit zone and a greater emphasis in the source countries. Let me tell you why that's the case. Let me use my own experience as a police officer again. When I entered police work up to just a few years ago, the conventional wisdom in policing was that we should randomly patrol the cities. Uh, the logic being if you showed up uh, at random, you, you prevent crime. We were doing the same thing, randomly patrolling out in the transit zone. 
Uh, what we learned in policing, and now we know in our interdiction efforts, is that random patrol produces random results. We want more from our resources, our efforts, than random results. And therefore, the switch took place where we went to a policy that's going to the source countries attempting to stop the drugs there. The problem, Mr. Chairman, is not the policy. The policy is that the problem is that the Congress cut a half a billion dollars from our interdiction efforts, and thus the budget got ahead of the policy. Now, is, is there any? Do you have any evidence that the source country program that you're you're referring to is working? Let me let me repeat what I said again: that the budget of this Congress got ahead of the policy. So it sounds like Cutting, it's not working. Well, I, I would not say. I think it's inaccurate I mean, it's to all, characterize all that it's not driven. working because we know that about a thousand metric tons of cocaine is produced uh, annually. We know that we consume in this country about a third of that. We also know that we interdict about a third of it, and a third is lost in transit that will go to other countries. The fact that we can interdict about a third of the cocaine that's produced has very meaningful and significant implications for us. Number one, we deprive the drug trafficking organizations of literally billions of dollars. They have to work twice as hard to supply the appetite of cocaine users in America. By the same token, every time we make a seizure, we also learn more about their drug trafficking operations, which gives us intelligence so we can continue our law enforcement interdiction efforts. Now, do we need to do more? Absolutely, we need to do more. Mr. Like, Chairman, I'd like to recognize John Micah Mr. from Florida. Mr. Chairman, reclaiming my time, I mean, okay. I think I've oh. lost a fair amount of it here. I, I do have a few more questions. Um, with regard to the issue of interdiction, you would agree with me, would you not, Dr. Brown, that the evidence showing a decline in interdiction does not establish that you are succeeding in those efforts? I don't agree with the, the chart that you have there because you're mixing two different things. Our interdiction efforts not geared at marijuana. Uh, so if you put a chart where you have interdiction uh, and marijuana use, those are two separately different issues. Well, let's just look at the interdiction line. I mean, the interdiction line shows a dramatic decline over the past few years. Do you dispute that? You say a dramatic decline? I'd call it dramatic. Yes. Is it? What do we have on that? I can provide you with more information on that. Uh, my recollection is that the interdiction uh, seizures have been rather stable over the years, not a dramatic <coughs> decline. Okay. Let me ask a different question. Um, you would agree with me that drug use amongst school students is up at every grade level. I mean, that evidence is before us. Does that suggest that we're succeeding in our interdiction efforts? Well, keep in mind that we're the ones who commission uh, those studies. And what we find is starting back in 1991, 1991 prior to this administration, I might add, that the drug use started to go. Well, let me just uh, read into the record something I did last time to help us develop an understanding because there, there appears to be some indication that the drug use started in January of 1999 when the president took office. That's just not the case. As I read into the record, I want to, would want to do it again. This is a document in the files of my office dated May 1st, 1992. And it says, policymakers in the Office of National Drug Control Policy have concluded that in 1991, 1991, both the supply of and the demand for cocaine increased from 1990, precisely the opposite outcome expected by the, pres the president's drug control strategy. Uh, this is something that was here before we came. I think it, it's incorrect to make assertion that the drug problem started in this administration's uh, Well, I'm not office. making that assumption at all. If it increased in 1991, that's bad, but it looks to me like it's increasing now also. It is increasing. We all have to be very much concerned about that. That's why I was offended that the Congress would take, a back, take back all the monies that we have well, for our wait, safe and drug free uh, well, schools like, program. One concluding remark. Very quick. Um, uh, that I hope to get a second round of questions but here. You will have. Let me say just quickly that I believe children see through hypocrisy instantaneously. I know my children do, and I don't, I don't envy you your job. It seems to me that we have a serious credibility problem in America when, when, when the president, in fact, cuts funding for this program by 2,000 percent when he takes office, and when Dr. Jocelyn Elders makes the comments she makes for me to go to my children and try to claim to them that we have a consistent policy in this country which discourages drug use. The president has not cut the the program that you're referring to. The Congress has been the one. The rescission package just passed by the House took 
$472 million from our Safe and Drug-Free Schools program for other purposes. Now, to me, that's outrageous that if you have what you identify drug use amongst our young people growing up, then you take back all the funds, almost all the funds, for the only program we have in this nation to educate our young people about the drug problem. Now, that's where we have the problem, Mr. Congressman. The, the President's first budget reduced the funding for your office from 101 million down to 5.8 million. Okay, thanks, John. I, uh, we will we'll give you another shot. I think you're, uh, you've got some good material. I know that you have some additional questions. Uh, uh, John Micah from Florida has been a leader in this effort. John. Thank you, and I didn't get to my uh, uh, second round last time. I appreciate the courtesy of the chairman. Uh, Dr. Brown, uh, thank you for coming back also. Um, this week, uh, the, the administration, an official of the administration, DEA deputy uh, administrator, uh, that's the Drug Enforcement Administration administration Administrator, uh, uh, and a top uh, State Department official, told the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on Western Hemisphere uh, uh, with Colombia still the hub of shipments uh, through and shipments through Mexico on the rise. Uh, do you concur with that statement? No, I would not disagree with that. We do have a very, very serious drug problem. Mexico no. is a major okay. source country. Now, let's talk country. about cocaine for a minute. Now, uh, 90, what, what percentage would you say of the cocaine comes through uh, Colombia, Bolivia, and Peru? About three quarters of the cocoa leaf is grown in Peru. Another quarter is grown in Bolivia, and um, the drug cartels are so basically it's about in 99 percent, 99.44 percent of the cocaine comes from those comes countries. Comes from those three countries. Now, they also testified. Mr. Green said Colombia produces 75 percent of the world's cocaine, or it's it's coming out of there as a end product. Is that correct? This is the administration official in his testimony this week. Well, Colombia would be the the home of the drug trafficking and organizations, where and that would be the, where the, the cocaine they, would come from. Where they process the cocaine. That is correct. Uh, in the early 80s, I was involved in the, uh, the uh, U.S. Senate uh, and helped draft some of the language relating to certification. And I remember when we put the certification language together, we, we modeled it really after human rights uh, violations. And we said when a country didn't take steps uh, to cur curtail its uh, uh, drug trafficking, just like uh, in improving uh, humanitarian uh, human rights efforts, uh, uh, we would, we would decertify that country. Uh, why hasn't President Clinton and you recommended that we de decertify uh, Colombia? Colombia was decertified. They were issued, the country, the country was issued a national interest waiver because it is in the best interest of the United States to continue to work with Colombia in addressing uh, the very serious drug problem. Would you recommend to the Congress that the most na uh, favored nation status uh, given to, as far as trade uh, for Colombia, be repealed? The certification process uh, involves. Now this is this is the uh, most favored nations uh, uh, stating uh, trading status. Would you uh, recommend to us? I have not looked at as an issue, but I, I might add. But you said that we we should use whatever means available uh, to uh, to try to elicit uh, support or attention to these problems. Now we've got 75 percent of the cocaine coming out of that one country, processed cocaine. Uh, what uh, what would you, what would uh, means should we use? But first of all, we are not going to deal with the problem by isolating any of those countries. We have to work with them. I might also add that we did not certify Colombia, but gave a national interest waiver. Uh, if the Congress disagreed with that, then the Congress had 30 days to do something about it. The Congress did not do anything. Are you about recommending it. to us that we decertify uh, Colombia uh, and that we also change the trade? I have not made a recommendation to you uh, on anything. We, I'd look forward to that. Now, the other point here is that. Uh, We've heard more about, more about Mexico, and your officials have testified to us that Mexico is becoming the Colombia of tomorrow, uh, today, actually. And uh, we've traced uh, the corruption in drug trafficking to the very highest levels of, uh, of uh, Mexico. In fact, it's, it, it's uh, in the last administration, I dare say it was in the, the president's office. In fact, even two weeks before 
this administration recommended uh, former President Salinas to uh, be the head of the World Trade Organization. It's my understanding officials uh, from either the Treasury Department or one of the U.S. agencies uh, briefed uh, 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 administration officials uh, relating to the corruption at the highest levels and that might even involve uh, President Salinas. Um, and, and yet we went on to recommend him for WTO uh, uh, representative. Are you aware of, uh, of any of uh, this information? or activities or briefings? If we look at the issue that you raised about Mexico, Mexico uh, was certified because in 1994, under the Salinas administration, their seizures went up. We found that their seizures of precursor chemicals went up. And uh, we, we, I'm encouraged by the actions and what's being said by, by the new president. It, he has publicly stated that narcotics trafficking represented the single greatest threat to Mexican national security. That's the security. current president? That is correct. All right, uh, but I, I'm, I'm saying the former president, even his cousin was, uh, we have uh, information that he was running a drug uh, uh, landing strip. We have uh, two members of his cabinet under investigation. We have uh, death of, uh, of uh, the highest religious officials and uh, officials in, in, in that uh, country. And, and this administration is recommending uh, the former president to head the w World Trade Organization. Did you ever send a communication saying that you thought this was bad? Did you have any knowledge that that uh, these folks were involved at the, these levels? And I did not send any communications to that effect. Okay, let me ask you another question. You said much of the drugs that come into this country John, come through this Mexico. This is going to be the last question. Final anyway. question. Sure. And uh, uh, you, you mentioned that we have to uh, and I think your words were, we, we also have to use bi bilateral uh, agreement, bilateral relations or things to, to uh, try to uh, get their attention. Now, I would say that trade and uh, finance assistance probably are our biggest handles on trying to get their attention. We ju this administration just approved a, a $20 billion bailout for Mexico. And is there any communication from you or from the President of the United States to the Mexicans saying that there are any conditions or that we want attention being paid to the, the drug trafficking, which we now see in every, every bit of evidence, Mexican car cartels expanding, Mexico's drug uh, stain, drug lords influence pervading Mexico. Every one of these say that Mexico's heavily involved. We have the biggest handle we've probably ever, ever had with a $20 billion bailout. Have you or the president sent any communication or attached any caveats to this money uh, uh, to uh, Mexico in, in the bailout? I have not sent any communications. I can't tell you what the president sent. I can tell you from my knowledge that there has been a general understanding that the Mexican government would increase their cooperation with the United States in dealing with the counter-narcotics issue. But one other point I want to make before an, um, your question is, is ended is the fact that the legislation passed by this Congress for certification has been taken serious by this administration. The President has been tougher in using that legislation than any other administration. And if the Congress is not satisfied with the, the decision of the President, then you have 30 days in which to do something different. The Congress did not. I'd still like your recommendation. Thank you, and I yield back. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to begin by just congratulating you and our ranking member for continuing this hearing and welcoming you back, Dr. Thank you. Brown. Thank you for being here. I would like to uh, begin by going back to some budget issues uh, that, that have been raised in previous questions. I'd like to ask, uh, you're familiar with the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, which I believe is part of the Department of the Treasury? FinCEN, yes, I am. I think it's known, yeah, fin, it's known as FinCEN for short, I do yes. believe. And uh, it's my understanding that pursuant to the uh, Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988, you're required to sign off as to whether the funds they have authorized for, um, uh, for their activities, which include anti-drug activities, are sufficient. I, I am required by law to certify the budgets of all the uh, drug control agencies at the federal level. 
including FinCEN. And I have a copy of a letter that uh, I'm told is unclassified. It's dated December 6, 1994. I believe it's in a packet that you were also presented here today in which you signed off that, uh, that there was a sufficient budget. And if I may quote in part, this is a letter from you to uh, Secretary Lloyd Benson of the Treasury Department. Pursuant to my responsibilities and authorities as described in, in the Act, I have completed my review of the fiscal year 1996 drug budget submissions of the Department of the Treasury. I certify that your request is adequate to implement the goals, priorities, and objectives of the National Drug Control Strategy. That's a letter where you are, you are signing off on the, on the budget, December, December 6th. Do you, do you recall that? Yes, sir, I do. Well, I tell you why I bring that up. I have a copy of another letter that I'm told is also unclassified. It's dated September 28, 1994. It is a letter from you, sir, to Mr. Stanley Morris, who is director of the Financial <coughs> Crimes Enforcement Network. And here's how this letter reads. Pursuant to my responsibilities and authorities, I have completed my review of the drug budget submission for the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network for the fiscal year 1996. This budget submission seems to reflect a serious shift of resources away from the drug program to other international criminal activity. I am seriously concerned whether the level requested for drug-related resources is adequate to implement the goals, priorities, and objectives of the National Drug Control Strategy. Now, that letter you submitted in, on September 28, 1994. That is correct. Well, what I'd like to know is what happened between <clears throat> September 28, 1994, where you appear to have objected to the budget uh, uh, as proposed by the Financial uh, Crimes Enforcement Network, and December 6, 1994, where you signed off in approval of that budget. By law, I am required to certify the budgets of all of the federal agencies involved in drug control certify that they're adequate to meet the president's drug control strategy. I do that in, in a letter form. You've read the letter to the secretary and one to Stanley Morris, who's director of the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. The one to Mr. Morris went out first where we raised the issue about reducing the uh, budget from a 80 percent drug related to 50 percent. As a result of that, we had an exclamation provided uh, to us. First of all, FinCEN is a service agency. Uh, they service Treasury, Justice. As a result of that, they're not operational. They're not conducting investigations. They pointed out that the various agencies they serve are asking for their services on other matters in addition to the drug, drug issues, uh, other criminal matters they're asking to provide services to them. Even that being the case where it went from 50 percent to 80 percent, in 1995, fiscal year 1995, uh, their budget was $11.3 million. Our request for this year is $12.2 million, which is an increase even with the 50 percent being scored as drug-related. Well, I heard, but I'm not entirely sure, sure I understood. Was there any change? in the recommended budget, uh, in the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network for drug-related activities, as you saw the figures from September 28th, when you appear to have objected to those figures, to December 6th, when you said those figures were adequate. Was there any if, specific change? If we have questions about any agency's budget, they will receive a letter such as the one I sent to Stanley Morris, raising our concern. That is followed up with with a meeting of correspondence or some other mechanism of having my question answered. In this instance, the answer to the, the issue that I raised was that the agencies that FinCEN services are requiring and making requests in more matters that are not drug related. And therefore, when they score their budget, they're going from an 80 percent drug related budget to 50 percent because their work is no longer 80 percent drug related. It's 50 percent drug related. But as I said, even in saying that, the budget request that we made for fiscal year 1996 increases their budget. So the answer very shortly is, very succinctly is that when their budget is scored, we look at what amount of time and effort are they putting into drug related matters. That's where we get the drug scoring. If it's not drug related, then we cannot score it as being drug related. 
but isn't, doesn't your first letter of September 28th indicate that based upon what you are seeing on how they are scoring the budget figures within what I understand is a, a group of funding priorities, that you have an objection to how they are funding and scoring for drug-related um, uh, financing, anti-drug activities? And Why? did anything change? Did they, did they change the formula? Uh, or make any other change from September 28th? My letter points out that further the budget submission proposed to change the methodology, and I think that's what's critical, used to score drug-related resources from 80 percent to only 50 percent. And I ask that please provide detailed justification to schedule a briefing or schedule a briefing for ONDC on the methodology change. They complied with my request. Uh, the methodology did not change, but the exclamation was given to us. The exclamation meaning that since FinCEN is a service organization, Department of Justice, uh, Treasury, call on them for financial uh, crimes enforcement information. As a result, they're getting more requests now for things that are not drug-related. Crimes, yes. Uh, drug-related, there's less requests or more requests for non drug-related information, and thus the change in methodology. The, the organization still works on drug cases uh, at, a, at an increasing rate, and that's why we have an increase in the budget for FinCEN uh, that's pending before the Congress. And you're saying that explanation alleviated your concerns so that you felt comfortable? That, that is correct. I felt comfortable in certifying their budget as being adequate to carry out the President's 1995 National Drug Control Strategy. Steve. I'm going to have, we'll have to come right. back. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to recognize uh, the gentlelady from Florida, Eliana Ross Layton. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brown, for being uh, with us today. Dr. Brown, uh, there is a growing concern that, that federal prevention monies <coughs> have not only been uh, uh, wasted, mismanagement, mismanaged, and, and uh, been ineffective, but actually that they've been spent on educational programs that teach value relativity, and they decline uh, to teach that illegal drug use is wrong, just plain and simple wrong. Uh, billions of dollars in federal prevention monies uh, have now been spent, much of it on so-called uh, value clarification programs such as Quest, and here's looking at you, too. Uh, and I'd like to ask you, uh, do these programs that teach uh, illegal drug use uh, uh, is, uh, is wrong under all circumstances, or do they, do they actually uh, teach uh, what the so-called uh, responsible use of uh, illegal drug use and of alcohol uh, by underage students? And I'd also like to know how much of federal money goes uh, each year to teaching the so-called values uh, clarification approach uh, uh, for our nation's students and are you aware uh, that uh, many studies have have shown that uh, these federal values clarification programs have not shown uh, uh, positive <clears throat> results and and I have here uh, uh, many uh, statements from uh, groups who have written to us, the members of this uh, subcommittee, because of our interest in the anti-drug effort. Here's one from the Washington Alliance of Families, and they say study after study proves that these programs do not produce their desired results, and worse yet, may even exacerbate the problem. In other words, they are a waste of taxpayers' money and a waste of time. Drug Watch International say, we believe that changes in the delivery system of prevention monies are appropriate. The federal programs for funding community and school drug prevention was flawed and prone to abuse, misdirection, and waste. The intent of the Drug Free Schools and Communities Act was to provide assistance to school and communities for comprehensive no drug use prevention projects. But somewhere along the way, many community partnerships turned uh, from citizen participation to government agency control. Uh, we have some documents from uh, the Office of Drug Control Policy from the state of Michigan saying, uh, in Michigan, more than $10 million in federal funds intended to provide our children a frontline defense against drugs was utilized for the following. 
over $81,900 for large teeth and giant toothbrushes, over $1.5 million on a human torso model used in one lesson of one grade, not even in the drug section of the curriculum, wooden cars with ping pong balls, over 12,300, hokey pokey song, over 18,000, over 7,000 on sheep eyes, uh, whatever that is, dog bone kits, $3,700, bicycle pumps, $11,000, latex gloves, 12,000, over $300,000 was spent on how we feel about sound. We have letters from constituents all across the nation as soon as this uh, committee, subcommittee was formed and we said that we would look at uh, drug fighting efforts. Here's one, a constituent uh, of in Indianapolis, uh, Indiana. She says, uh, these non-directive programs are often funded through federal drug-free school grants, yet they do not usually comply with federal law requiring that students be taught that drug use is wrong and harmful. Here's a federal publication, uh, federally funded, that uh, tells the, uh, the teachers, this is a teacher manual, this one is on uh, smoking, drinking, and drugs. Let me read to you what they say about uh, drinking. They say to the teacher, no matter what points you what points you eventually choose to discuss don't begin negatively with admonishments about the dangers of drinking good lord we would not want to do that as a way to begin list or brainstorm with your students some reasons why some people might give for drinking here are some examples it can be relaxing etc point out that if students decide to drink they will need to consider how much when where and with whom and then in order to make that decision uh, uh, better for the students, they give a handy dandy little wheel that they can use. I'm figuring out how much I can drink in order uh, to have responsible uh, alcohol abuse. And they say, suppose you've had three drinks. There's a premise to start for, uh, for high school and junior high school students, and on and on. And I, so I'd like to go back to my original uh, question about how you as the nation's drug czar feel that these uh, supposed uh, uh, values uh, clarification courses teach children that drug use is wrong. And do you think that part of the basic core of our curriculum in high schools and junior high and elementary school should start with the premise that it is wrong and illegal drug use is very wrong? The answer to your question is I absolutely do feel that the basic premise, the foundation upon which we start must be that drug use is wrong. One should not be teaching responsible drug use to our children. If that is being done, it's wrong, it should be stopped. Uh, I believe very strongly, as is indicated in the President's drug control strategy, we must have a consistent message. That message must be no use, no use, period. That message must go from kindergarten all the way up to the 12th grade. Have there been abuses in the why program? These, why are these curriculum, what are you doing in your capacity to make sure that this values a clarification, uh, all of this is relative to one's own philosophy, is going out to the schools and they are federally funded. What can you in your capacity do to have this stop? As you know, the Department of Education administers the Safe and Drug-Free Schools program. We have, through my office, been working with the Department of Education and looking at how do you set up standards for addressing the problem. Uh, the uh, states are now required to identify the nature of their drug problem and develop their program design uh, to address it. Uh, having measures of effectiveness uh, identified up front, uh, what steps are to be designed to achieve those goals are a very important part of what we're trying to do. Clearly, as in, is in the case in many programs, there are abuses. I think working through the various state governments, uh, our Department of Education is in the process of monitoring more about what goes on in order to alleviate and hopefully eliminate all the abuses in the program that takes place. But we do know much more now about what works in our school system than we did before. We know, for example, that when we address drug education in our school system, we must have a consistent message and it's certainly the position of the President's National Drug Control Strategy that message must be no use, period. Not teaching anyone about responsible drug use, that's ridiculous. It doesn't make sense. That's something we would not support. By the same well, token, we know that we must following gear... Following up on that, Dr. Brown, I'm glad to hear you say that, that it is ridiculous. I think that it's a total misuse 
of federal funds. And I would hope that in, in your capacity, you would take this as one of the most important missions of your office to make sure that this money, the very precious money that we have, is used in the correct capacity. And I think that leadership must come from the top. I think that if we allow, and we have uh, so many of these uh, uh, so many of these programs here. I have letters or studies from Michigan, West Virginia, Massachusetts, Texas, Washington State, uh, two from Kansas. And, and aren't these abuses a, a good reason uh, to, to vote for the rescission of these wasteful, counterproductive uh, programs so that we can have a better use uh, of our federal funds to review these programs? We have clear evidence that this is a misuse of federal funds. The and the leadership must come from above to keep funding these programs that are failed, I don't think it does uh, the children any good. I don't think that it does our community any good. And I don't think that our, our federal dollars are used correctly. Uh, we would be glad to share this material with you. I would hope that you would contact these school systems and say uh, it's not enough that we keep refunding these programs year after year without examining exactly what they're doing if the with our dollars. If the gentlewoman will yield. Yes. It's my understanding that we did the reauthorization last year of the uh, safe and drug free schools, if I'm not correct, and that in fact we have tightened up uh, in looking at how they're achieving those goals and report of their progress uh, on a regular basis. So we're trying to put some accountability back into this program. Reclaiming um, my time, that could be true, but these letters are dated uh, March, uh, just a few weeks ago when we announced that we were going to continue with these hearings. And these are teaching modules that are still going out. So if, if that has happened, I don't think that it's gotten to the local school system. As a, as a mother of two uh, children, nine and seven years old, I would be horrified if they are in a class that teaches them that they can be responsible about illegal drug use. I don't think that that's a wise use of our federal dollars. So if that, uh, if that message has gotten out, uh, I, I don't think it's filtered to the local level. And they're the ones, those teachers are the ones who are in contact uh, with my children and with all of our children. So let's get the word out, Dr. Brown, that is my strong recommendation that these programs are not effective and they're not teaching children the correct uh, uh, message that we would like them to receive. Let me Thank you. just respectfully disagree with the conclusion that you've reached that the program is not effective. Uh, I have visited programs that are very effective. Even here in our nation's capital, we've seen programs where young people raise a very important question about the effectiveness of the program. I visited a junior high school just a few days ago and talking about the rescission where all the funds are being taken back from this program and the young lady asked a very astute question. If the funds for prevention are taken from us, what message are we sending to the, to the children of America? I can tell you as many success stories, and I'll take that back, many more success stories than you've told me horror stories, programs that I visited. The legislation that was put forth by the, the Safe and Drug-Free Schools program, legislation passed by this Congress, tries to, to achieve two very important goals. Number one, to give the states and localities broad flexibility to use the funds to address problems that they see as relevant to their jurisdictions. And two, assign explicit responsibility for oversight, oversight and accountability for the use of those funds. Uh, the reauthorization of the program strengthens the state's responsibility for oversight giving them the authority to approve or disapprove applications for funding by local school districts. By the same token, there are routine audits of state and local programs that are channeled through the Education Department's Office of Inspection General, these routine site visits by uh, education staff people. So there are many, many good programs. I think it would be wrong to characterize the entire program as bad because of bad examples. I would be the first to admit that there are abuses of the program, like in any program that we may have at the federal government. However, Brown, it's very if, if important I, for I us to not lose sight of the I know fight. I just have a few seconds left, but uh, uh, we have alluded previously uh, to the uh, letter that you wrote to uh, the Assistant Secretary uh, of the Office of, the, uh, of Elementary and Secondary Education, where you yourself uh, pointed out uh, seven accountability issues. Uh, this is a uh, July 15, uh, 1994 uh, uh, letter. And so I, I believe that it's uh, hypocritical, excuse me, sir, but for you to, uh, to attack uh, some of us who are 
pointing out the ineffectiveness uh, of the programs uh, when you saw and, and wrote on it uh, yourself. And I hope that they're not just, uh, you realize that they're not just isolated uh, horror stories. Uh, we have he heard these complaints from school teachers and from parents uh, for many years that they strongly believe that this money has not been uh, uh, wisely spent. So, and I would hope uh, that you could let us know, did you get any response to the seven accountability issues that you raised uh, in your letter to the Assistant Secretary? I would suggest as far from being hypocritical, it's responsibility of my carrying out my responsibility. If I see areas where we need improvement, improvement in any of our programs, I'm going to raise those issues. That's my job. Uh, also, I think it's important to, to again, restress the issue that the fact that we have some abuses in a program, it's outrageous for the Congress to take back all the funds for the only program at the federal level that's providing resources to school districts. Ninety-four percent of the school districts in America, America participate in, in those programs. What you decide to do is deprive children uh, of the only program that we support, support to deal with education for prevention purposes, dealing with drugs in our schools. That, in my estimation, is outrageous. Dr. Brown, <clears throat> isn't it true that an additional $2 billion is available through HHS for these same kind of programs? And isn't it true that these programs are duplicative? And aren't we kind of politicizing uh, the message? The message is that some of these resources here are not working. Um, you, by your own admission, you agree. I think we tried to point this out. Obviously, you have a big challenge before you. And, uh, you know, there's, a, there's monies out there that haven't been used that are available for these same kind of programs. We're also hearing since we started these hearings from all across America that, that there's much misuse. Uh, and I think, I think you know, the gentlelady very adequately brought out some of those examples. You ought to, in my judgment, take a good look at some of these things, weed out the ones that aren't working. But, you know, if, if, if the rescission package includes a small piece that is duplicative and there are other monies and resources available, I don't think we want to hook our whole lives on, on, on that one issue particularly when there's two, over $2 billion of money still available and uncommitted. The, the premise upon which you pose your question is not correct, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, these numbers are just not correct that, that you're uh, using to base your question. For this fiscal year, Health and Human Services, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, they have $430 million in funding targeted for prevention. That includes block grant monies as well as demonstration funds. And as you know, most states have used these prevention funds to build a prevention infrastructure in each state. The only funds that are provided for our school program is the Safe and Drug-Free Schools program, not the funds that are used for other purposes in health and human services. That's why I have such strong feelings about the Congress taking all of the monies that we have for our children the cornerstone of this nation's program to educate our children about the dangers of drug use at a time where we find that drug use is going up. Mr. Chairman, it doesn't make sense. There's no logic behind it. It's outrageous. At a time where your charts, any chart, any survey you want to look at tells us that drug use amongst our adolescents is going up, and we have one program that provides funds to 94 percent of the school districts in this country, and that's part of your rescission package. How do you explain that to the but children of America? I, I think that uh, where, where we're trying to uh, come out of this thing is to put accountability and targeted programs with targeted results and, and accountability. Where I think your programs are lacking, uh, this, this is where it's fallen down. And we have many, many examples where, where there's much misuse. I think uh, I'm not going to waste your time by going back over all her testimony, but I think it was right on the point. And I think what we need to do is tighten up the program. We need to use better leadership. We need to have accountability. And, and uh, I, I think that uh, this Congress will be happy to support uh, programs that will work. I, I think I'd like to recognize right now uh, the gentleman from uh, Maryland, Bob Ehrlich, who is the vice chair of the subcommittee. Sir, we appreciate you coming back today. We really do. It's my pleasure. Good discussion. Uh, let me refocus the discussion here <clears throat> with respect to two different matters. First, I'd like to revisit the customs issue. Reading from your testimony given to our subcommittee on March 9th, you said that we intend to review current enforcement efforts at the southwest border to reduce the amount of drugs smuggled across the border. 
as well as border violence. The reduction of drug smuggling across the southwest border will remain the top priority for U.S. Customs Service. I switch now to the uh, an LA Times article dated February 13, 1995. The article begins, the amount of cocaine seized from Mexican trucks and cargo at the border plummeted last year as U.S. Customs Service officials pressed on with a program to promote trade by letting most commercial cargo pass into this country without inspection. Not a single pound of cocaine was confiscated from more than two million trucks that passed through three of the busiest entry points along the southwest border where federal officials say most of the drug enters this country. Of the 62,000 pounds of cocaine that Customs seized from commercial cargo nationwide, less than a ton was taken from shipments along the border with Mexico. Obviously, I'm trying to get clear my own mind with respect to the status of the program, uh, and I guess I'll throw one more fact into the question. From your 1995 budget summary and the President's uh, own budget, uh, he requested that U.S. Customs funding be cut, set from $573 million to $500 million. My question to you, sir, is what is our present policy and what is the current status of your review with respect to the enforcement efforts at the southwest border? First of all, our Customs Service is working very hard to improve the, fist, the system of dealing with interdiction at our borders. On two separate occasions, I've visited the border myself, one with the commissioner where we announced Operation Hardline, where we're putting more agents on the border, where we're using uh, technology to address the problem. The second was we announced a border technology center there to use technology from other places to deal with the problem. Uh, there are about 200 thousand cars a day to come across the border. And it's a monumental task to address the problem. But I can tell you that we are very, very concerned about it, and we're working hard to improve our efforts there on the southwest border. The customs people have implemented training initiatives for their officers. The customs commissioner has traveled to 2,000 miles of the border and telling the agents that their responsibility is to do whatever is possible to intercept the drugs that come across our border. So there are things we're doing. We have other agencies involved, such as Border Patrol, that although they're there for immigration purposes, they're also there to deal with problems of smuggling illegal substances as well as narcotics across our border. Now, now, with respect to the, the smuggling, uh, you testified at our last hearing, you repeated here and today, in fact, that uh, more than 70 percent of the cocaine entering the U.S. crosses the border with Mexico, and an increasing amount is smuggled in cargo containers. Uh, I, my question to you would be, why has the, pres the President cut the budget for National Guard container searches on that border? and? Do you have any policy with respect to, to changing the way we are operating this particular program? The National Guard, unknown to many people, plays a very important role in our counter-narcotics efforts. Uh, their budget, as you know, is part of the Department of Defense, and they're making some realignments in their overall budget because we had such a substantial cut in our interdiction budget by the Congress, not the President. Uh, the, as, as I pointed out earlier, the Congress cut the Department of Defense interdiction budget by some, some $300 million. So they have to adjust to that cut. Therefore, we can't do all the things that we were doing based upon that substantial reduction in resources to DOD. Now, is that the state of the art with respect to uh, smuggling? I'm sorry? The DMO that the, uh, the smugglers are using, is that state of the art now, the new containerization? Is that how they're, they're accomplishing their, uh, their deed? The smugglers, the drug traffickers, are very creative. They use a variety of ways of bringing drugs into the country. They use cargo planes, they use the cargo containers, they use individuals, cars, uh, you name it, they're trying it. 
I guess uh, the point I would like to make to you is just that we are concerned that the president seems to have de-emphasized the role the National Guard can play with respect to uh, this container issue. L let me just, I realize my time runs run short, let me raise a somewhat completely different issue with you. And uh, just get your comment on something. You will recall the firestorm which occurred recently when the speaker raised a question about uh, drug use with respect to White House staff. And uh, Mr. Panetta criticized the speaker for his comments and, and all that. And I read recently in the Washington Times that uh, now 11 White House staffers are in a special random drug testing program because of concerns about, quote, recent drug use. And this is testimony from the director of the White House Office of Administration, Patsy Thomason, in testimony before a Senate subcommittee. So I guess my question to you would be, uh, what's recent? What drugs are we talking about? And what's your office doing about it? Just to answer your previous question first, so we can bring closure to that. Uh, much of the drugs smuggled across the U.S. and Mexican border come, will come in vehicles. I said some 200,000 vehicles cross every, every day. And it would not be correct, Mr. Congressman, to say that the President is cutting the National Guard's budget. The Congress cut the Department of Defense budget by some $300 million. So it's not correct to say that the President is cutting the budget. To the contrary, the President is asking the Congress for funds to carry out his national drug control strategy. It's not correct to, to point that toward the President. In respect to your question, every uh, testing designated position that's our senior and sensitive positions in the executive office of the President is covered by pre-employment and random drug testing. Uh, when I took this position, I was required to be testing prior to assuming my position I am in the computer. I'm subject to random testing at every any time. Every one of my staff is covered by the drug testing rules. Uh, the federal employment and random drug testing is required by some 428,000 federal employees who are in the senior and the sensitive positions. I believe that all federal employees should be subject to pre-employment and random testing, including the members of the Congress, the people who work for the Congress. They should also be subject to the same rules that we are required to in, in, in terms of our responsibilities as parts of the administration. Uh, sir, I, I agree with you, but I, let me revisit my question. Uh, the Speaker made a statement, the Speaker was criticized by the Chief of Staff, yet it now appears that the Speaker uh, may have been on to something. And, and let me ask you specifically that uh, about the statement by Ms. Thomason concerning recent drug use by White House staffers. My question to you, sir, is how recent, what drugs, and what is your office doing about it? In my office is a policy office. I do not administer drug tests. Uh, that's handled by another agency, so I don't have an answer to your question. Thank you. I think the, the problem here is, though, if we are going to lead by example, the White House has to lead by example, as we do as well. And I'd certainly agree with your idea and recommendation that we all be drug tested. I would recommend that those who work for the Congress also be subject to drug testing. Absolutely. Just as those who work in the executive office of the President. This is the, this, this is maybe, you know, I, I think it's very hard to put out a, a very strong just say no to drugs if at the top, and, and by the top you've got 11 people if, if that's in fact um, the case that we've got a problem right at the White House, then it's very hard for you to put your message out. Uh, I'd like to refer now and uh, recognize Peter Blute from Massachusetts. Peter. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to commend you and the ranking member for having these hearings and commend uh, Dr. Brown for uh, coming here. We know you have a tough job. Uh, I want to personally thank you for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule last year. Uh, to attend the funeral of a slain police officer in my district. Mm -hmm. I know uh, his family and my constituents appreciated your presence there very much. Uh, my question uh, gets back again, I think, uh, importantly, to Mexico. Many of us in the Congress on both sides of the aisle are concerned about uh, the administration's approach to our entire relationship with Mexico. 
Uh, I was one of those uh, in a bipartisan way that opposed the North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, for example, because of our concern about the Mexican government. Uh, we were concerned about their veracity, uh, about their very integrity. Uh, and as we now know, they were not straightforward with us uh, about the value of their peso, for example, uh, with disastrous results. Uh, and I believe that you can't disconnect the financial relationship that a country has with another country and the law enforcement relationship. In less than a, or a little over a year and a half after uh, NAFTA was passed, we read in the Washington Post that uh, Mexico, for decades a key transshipment point for cocaine entering the United States, has expanded its role over the past year as a clearinghouse for worldwide drug shipments and money, money laundering with the active help of business leaders and government officials. And part of the reason that the drug organizations have been so successful is that they devote tens of millions of dollars in profits for payoffs to Mexican government and law enforcement officials. Uh, my question uh, relates to the North American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, there are indications that the eased access for Mexican trucking uh, has uh, increased uh, contraband, uh, increased the flow of l illegal drugs across the Mexican-U.S. border. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, uh, observing this over the last year or so, uh, to what extent has NAFTA inadvertently uh, increased drug flow from Mexico to the United States? If we take the consensus of all the U.S. law enforcement officials, the conclusion would be that NAFTA has not had an effect, uh, any significant effect, on the increase in the flow of Ill illegal drugs and to our country. The reason being that NAFTA reduces tariffs. It does not relax our customs inspections. As a result of NAFTA, we've increased the number of in customs inspections on the border. We're developing, in my office, taking the leadership, non-intrusive inspections uh, technology. We've implemented cooperative arrangements with major Mexican shippers that allow inspections, the inspectors to focus on unknown or, or, or suspect shippers. We've increased Border Patrol staffing along the border and improved the secure communications and sensor systems. We've improved operational coordination along the border through uh, the HIDA program, a program that's operated through my office, and we're continuing our effort to work to stop the drugs from coming across our border. So NAFTA, uh, the, from the consensus of everyone involved in enforcement, has not had an impact on a significant increase in drugs coming across our border. Well, let me just say that uh, there's no doubt that there's uh, increasing numbers of uh, uh, trucking uh, runs between Mexico and the United States. Uh, clearly, the number of uh, customs officials have not increased uh, uh, significantly uh, to deal with that. And I would uh, urge uh, your uh, administration to be uh, uh, very uh, observant to uh, this uh, opportunity for the flow of drugs into the United States. One last question, because I know we are, we're short on time. Um, recently, the president announced uh, his... Uh, uh, Mexican uh, peso bailout strategy, a $20 billion uh, bailout, uh, which I oppose and which I think should have come before the Congress of the United States, rightfully so in our role as uh, having the uh, power of the purse. But having said that, uh, $20 billion is a heck of a lot of leverage. And I want to follow up on what Mr. Micah re asked you. Why didn't the President expressly and publicly tie the Mexican financial aid package to a Mexican government promise to crack down on their increased drug trade. There, there was great debate about that issue. Uh, the final conclusion was that there, there are general understandings that the Mexican government will work closer with us in addressing the drug problem. That's a general agreement. Everyone understands that. By the same token, when we talk about the whole issue of corruption, uh, one of the th things I know, certainly from being a law enforcement official for all of my career, that drugs, uh, because of the vast amount of money involved, they corrupt people. We find individual people with trust in our country corrupted by the drug problem. The same thing happens in Mexico. Individuals there are corrupted by the drug problem. I am encouraged because there, the recently inaugurated president is pointing out 
but he understands that and he's moving hard and fast on improving the conditions there. And so what I think we must do is continue to work with uh, Mexico to help address the problem associated with 70 percent of the drugs that come into our country, that's cocaine, coming through Mexico. We can't neglect Mexico. It's very important for us in terms of addressing the problem that is so, so significant on the streets of our cities. I thank our thank colleague you, from Chairman. Massachusetts. Uh, our colleague from California, Mr. Gary Condit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and let me um, um, commend you for um, your uh, leadership in this area and uh, apologize for being late. And for the record, let you know that we have another hearing going on in agriculture, so I, I apologize for coming in late, and I'm going to have to leave in a little bit. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Brown for, for coming over. Um, I, I won't dwell on uh, interdiction and, and the law enforcement part of this. I, I, I do have a great deal of interest in uh, some of the comments that were made in, in reference to interdiction and NAFTA and would encourage you to, uh, to heed uh, what was said uh, by my colleagues over there that we, we need to um, um, review and do oversight of, of NAFTA and the implications of trafficking and, and, um, and some of the trucking policies with NAFTA and, and would encourage you to do that, Dr. Brown. And I know that you, you are looking at that and, and we'll keep an eye on it. I would like to focus on just for a, a few minutes, if I may, and get your response to um, the area of treatment. Um, I think there ought to be a, a treatment policy and a portion of, of the drug policy by the administration and by this Congress. Uh, I think people who um, decide that they want to get off drugs and, um, uh, and want some treatment, we ought to be uh, able to try to fil facilitate that if we possibly can. I, I, over the years, I've had numerous parents come to me and say, I'd like to do something, can't afford it. And um, I, I would like for you to tell me um, how has the, the president's drug policy involving treatment uh, different from the policy of previous administrations? And, and uh, can you kind of explain what the uh, uh, rationale underlying uh, the differences uh, may be in those policies? And then I got a couple follow up questions. Yes, sir. The president's national drug control strategy has as its overarching goal the reduction of drug use in America. And we feel that that we must place a greater emphasis and indeed more resources in demand reduction, prevention, education, and treatment while not neglecting aggressive enforcement interdiction as well as our international programs. Our program, or at least our strategy, differ from previous administrations in that previous administrations placed the greater emphasis on casual drug re reduction and did not focus on the chronic, hardcore, addicted drug user population. Our strategy focuses on the chronic hardcore drug user population, which comprise about 20 percent of the drug users, yet they consume three quarters of the drugs that are sold on the streets of our cities. They commit much of the crime. They cause our health care costs to soar. They spread diseases. So to me, it makes good sense to focus on that group. And I say that not from a, a social worker perspective, because I'm a cop. cop. I've arrested people for drug use. In agencies I've headed, we've arrested up to 100,000 people a year just for drug use. I think it, it's, a, it's important for us to understand at this point in time that that has not solved the problem. Therefore, we must do what the President proposes to do in the strategy is to provide more resources for treatment. California, for example, in 1992, the state of California invested $209 million in treatment for one year. But that investment saved the taxpayers $1.5 billion. That's a pretty good investment. The Rand Corporation's policy, the Drug Policy Center looked at all the, the modalities for reducing drug use in the United States. And they pointed out that treatment is the most effective. That is the reason we're asking for additional resources for a treatment pro program that would address the, the hardcore, addicted drug user population. That's why our drug court concept was so important, part of the Crime Control Act that was passed by the Congress. That's why I was so disappointed that those funds are being uh, rescinded again, taken away from us to help us address the problem because they've been so successful. Uh, so treatment works. In my estimate, estimation, if you want to deal with the drug problem, you have to do something about those who are addicted to drugs. It's just that simple. It's not a complicated matter. If you have 20 percent of the drug-using population consuming up almost 80 percent of the drugs, that they are the ones committing much of the crime, it makes good sense to provide treatment for them. 
including treatment within our jails and prisons. And that's what we're attempting to do that's different from previous administrations. We believe that treatment works and makes good sense. It's not only good drug policy, it's good crime policy, it's good health policy, it's basically good economic policy. Congressman, would you, would you yield just for a minute on, on, a, on something that's Absol pertinent? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I also serve on the Judiciary Committee, and I feel that I should point out that the, the uh, crime bill as passed by the House of Representatives puts potential funds for drug courts in block grants to states and communities, and if they wish to, they can spend even more money on drug courts than is in the crime bill that passed in 1994. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, I think Dr. Brown uh, uh, summarized the, the differences very well, and, and I think he dealt with the, uh, the, what we hear sometimes, the, the criticism of, uh, of treatment, and uh, it's, it's causing an increase in casual use, and I appreciate that very much. I, I'd like to focus, maybe you can be more specific, in, in the areas of uh, the criminal areas, such as prison rehabilitation and treatment. Uh, we hear much complaint about uh, people who go to prison, um, don't get much treatment, and can you kind of, for us, maybe give us some indication? I, I know it may be a hard uh, place to give treatment, and, and people have to be willing to want treatment, but maybe you can explain mm -hmm. to us how, how the program works in, in that kind of area. The majority of the people that we arrest have a substance abuse problem. So logically, we should do something about that problem before releasing them back to society. Historically, we have not. They've been arrested, serve their time, and go back on the streets in the same, if not a worse condition than when they went in. We think that's wrong policy. And as a result of that, there are funds in the Crime Control Act for treatment within our jails and prisons. We know also from empirical research that coercive treatment also works. And so placing one in a treatment program while they're in jail or prison will bear positive results for the individual, but most important, also for society. I've had a chance to even visit a therapeutic community prisons, where a whole prison is set up for rehabilitation of the drug offenders. I think that holds great promise. Uh, again, it's logical if you have the majority of the people who are committing crimes, being arrested, and going to our jails and prisons, have a substance abuse problem just makes good sense to do something about that problem prior to releasing them back to the streets of our cities. That's part of our national drug control strategy, and I'm very pleased that at least the, the changes made by the Congress of the House and the Crime Control Act did not take back those funds for treatment within the criminal justice system. If, if I may follow up, and I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, but can, uh, Dr. Brown, can you be specific and, and, and give me an example of, of the kind of treatment that, I mean, that we get in, in prison? I mean, it, it, I mean, is, do you, do you have a 12-step program, something mm -hmm. similar to that? What do you, and, and who do you contract with? I, I visited treatment programs in county jails, and to describe one in the state, the state of Arizona I visited where the inmates there would go through the 12-step program, group counseling, as well as looking at other issues that may have caused them to get into uh, the problem of drug use to begin with, uh, such as vocational training. One of the major elements that I hear from those who are in treatment that it helps them improve their, their self-esteem. The drug users uh, did not consider themselves to be very important people. So addressing that, addressing their vocational training is very important. In Texas, I visited a prison where the whole prison is ran by a non-governmental agency, but it's a therapeutic community. And I've sat in on their, their sessions, their group sessions. But in addition to the counseling, the 12-step program, there are also programs there to deal with the problems that got the person into difficulty to begin with. Many of them are, are dropouts, and therefore they have a GED training. Many of them were unskilled and unemployable, and therefore they're being given uh, vocational training. And then aftercare is also an important part of that. It, it, it would not be effective to provide treatment within the prison system when they would go back into the same environment and fall into, the, if you would, the same traps that got into them into difficulty to begin with. So aftercare is important. 
So treatment follows a whole range. You have on the one extreme, you can have therapeutic communities in a prison. On the other extreme, you can have just counseling groups, the 12-step program or similar programs. Do you think at this time we have an appropriate balance between treatment, interdiction, law enforcement, et cetera? We have about one million people in this country that we know need and can benefit from treatment that are not being served by the funds we have available. So treatment is underfunded. Uh, for, the, for the current fiscal year, we asked for $355 million for our hardcore drug treatment initiative. We got $57 million, far, far less than we need. And so we need to do more in treatment for the long range. If we want to really get a handle on solving the drug problem, we have to deal with individuals who are the addicted drug users and get them off of drugs. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I, I, I wanted to uh, focus on treatment, I, I, but I don't want Dr. Brown or anyone else in the room to I get the impression that I'm not interested in interdiction. I know that you guys covered that before I got here. I think that we, we need to have a balance of, of interdiction, treatment, and, and involvement in law enforcement. Uh, and I do appreciate your efforts, Dr. Brown. This is an awesome task that you have before you, but it's a very important task to this country and, and to uh, to uh, our success as a country, and I appreciate your efforts, and I appreciate you being Thank here. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I might add, just in closing on your question or your last statement, that the President's 1995 National Drug Control Strategy is comprehensive. We deal with aggressive enforcement with FBI, DEA, agents being up to par in terms of our budget requests. We, we have, uh, at least we had, prevention monies in our safe and drug-free schools programs. Hopefully the Senate will... Uh, uh, we'll use this wisdom and restore those funds. Uh, interdiction is still a very important, will always be a very important part of what we do. In addition to that, our international program. So it is comprehensive, but we do also believe that the ultimate answer has to be to get people to stop using drugs. No demand, no supply. I'd like to uh, recognize our colleague from Indiana, Mark Satter. Thank you, Dr. Who's been Brown. very patient, incidentally. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for coming again today. Um, I have a, a couple of series of questions, but I wanted to first make a comment also on the Mexico question. I'm very concerned that people don't perceive in foreign nations that the United States government is in the business of rewarding people for shipping drugs to this country. Our policy has not worked well in Colombia, and now we're repeating it in Mexico. What we see is first they get NAFTA with uh, uh, things disguised and, and not told to us about information. Then we start as they become an even bigger drug supplier, potentially, and uh, at least at, the, uh, at this point it looks like they will be bigger than Colombia. We're going to uh, bail them out with a minimum of $20 billion. I hope the next step, if they continue to not control their problem, isn't to give them the southwestern United States and hope that that maybe will help them to behave. We have to take a firmer hand in this type of thing rather than just rewarding that. It's a bad signal around the world that ship us drugs and will help bail out your economy. Uh, but I, I really would like to, uh, you on record is not agreeing with that and I under, understand that. I might just make a quick response okay. to it. Clearly we're not awarding Mexico for shipping drugs into this country. That is just not the case, Mr. Congressman. We're rewarding them for... We're not a, you said there's a bigger you, issue oh. than the drug issue. We're talking about the, the peso and, and the economic stability of this hemisphere. So, But you're saying that we hope that by giving you money you'll change your behavior. And that is, uh, in other words, that, oh, well, the government's going to cooperate with us now, and they didn't in the past, and now maybe this new government will be different. Let's wait to give them things until uh, they show they'll cooperate. I, I did not say that. Let's on it. I did not say that. You said that you felt that this will help them, uh, uh, that they're struggling, they've made commitments that they're going to try to change, that we need to help their economy, that it's difficult. I mean, there are that line of argument is why we need to give them economic assistance. Well, I think it's just wrong to make a comment that we're rewarding Mexico for shipping drugs to America. That's just out and out wrong. I believe that that can be taken, uh, uh, and that's why I said I want to make it clear that that's not what we're doing, but that's what it looks like to co countries who are putting more in, they get more reward the more they put in. That's what it starts to look like. Uh, I hope that isn't taken that way. I think well, that's the, a very I singular think, focus on the issue that we're talking about. If I could it's much more complex than second. that, Mr. Congressman. If I could jump in for a second, I think there's probably an opportunity lost as we were providing 
that bailout uh, not to tie into it some kind of recognition of the need to work closer with Mexico in terms of drug interdiction. And I think that's, that's basically what we're trying to do. But uh, obviously, you, although you have had responsibility for the drug war, probably didn't make that decision. So we, we appreciate that. Uh, I, I had some very specific questions. Uh, as you know, President Clinton's former Attorney General Jocelyn Elders had supported the uh, uh, legalization of illegal drugs and said that there were studies uh, that supported this. I wanted to look into it and said that there were studies worldwide that supported uh, uh, that legalization of illegal drugs uh, worked. Can you assure me that your office uh, never requested from the Surgeon General copies of those studies? Again, with all due respect, the Surgeon General elders uh, did not say that. She said that we should look into it and that there were studies around the world uh, that, sh uh, that would be helpful. Did you ever request from her those studies? As you may recall, she spoke before the press club and answered the questions about uh, crime and drugs. She indicated that she thought that it might be worth looking at the, the, what impact legalization would have on crime. She did not call for it. And you, uh, certainly at that point in time, what, sir, you called elders. I know, I know. Okay. At, at that point in time, uh, I spoke up. Literally everybody in the administration spoke up. She spoke her, her position. I disagree with her. I, 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 along with President Clinton, we take a very, very strong stand against legalization. You, the president stated request, that he's unequivocally ever, opposed to legalization of drugs. Did you to answer ever, your question, yes, I did request any studies she was aware of about where legalization took the crime out of drugs. She did not send me any studies. I don't think any such studies exist. Thank you. Um, I had one other uh, question I wanted to get into a little bit. And that is, um, it's important that as uh, drugs are, you get out and see what's going on in, in America and around the world. But there's been a lot of criticism of your travel because there's been a lot of that, some of it tied to uh, personal visits uh, in Chicago and in California. Can you assure us that the official visits came before the family visits and that the family visits were not set and then you uh, solicited official well, never have I done any personal travel on government business. Anything I do on government business is government business. I do not mix the two. I've never traveled personally on government funds. So when you went to Chicago at Thanksgiving and at Christmas and the trips in California, uh, did you pay for the tickets? There are times I've gone that I've paid for tickets, yes. Which ones are you referring to? If you're referring to the article written by Mr. York, let me, let me clarify that for you. He requested information clearly with a slant as to how he wanted to write his story. And indeed, he did try to market it to different uh, publications, and most of them did not uh, publish, publish it. They did go into one publication. And he makes an allegation that I went to Chicago relative to the christening of my grandson. That's just absolutely false. It's a lie. Uh, I went to Chicago, and my son and my daughter-in-law scheduled the christening around my visit. I did not go there for that purpose. So I mean, let me be very clear. I know my response. I'm, I have been in my business as a law enforcement officer for over 30 years. I know my responsibilities. I know I'm not to travel on federal funds for, per, for personal purposes. I've never done that, nor will I ever intend to do that. And um, I've, I find it awkward to ask the questions. I find part of our it awkward to have to answer the questions. It's too. our responsibility to at least follow up when an allegation like that is made. And, and one of the questions I have is, is that can you assure us, as you have in general terms, that in specific terms that uh, you said the christening uh, uh, in, in, in December uh, of that year, also in the three trips to California, that you did not solicit the public events after knowing you wanted to visit uh, family or friends. Mr. Congressman, I do not have to solicit any public events to go any place in this country. I can't do all the requests that are asked of me. I have never solicited an event to go visit any place for any personal purposes. The article that was written is off base, it's wrong, it's false. Never have I in my career violate the trust that's been bestowed upon me. Okay, thank you. Congressman, uh, 
uh, <coughs> Micah, if you'll hold for a second, um, I want to refer to uh, Mrs. Thurman, and then uh, we'll get back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I need to, to go back to this, this issue of values clarification and, and what's being done with this money. I might ask this chairman, particularly since we do have letters that have been written uh, to either members or to this committee as they were referred to, that I certainly would like to have an opportunity to have those particular governors that names and or programs were mentioned to respond. Um, I'm outraged by the fact that we might see some of these dollars being spent for less than what they were intended to be spent. That might in fact have a purpose and a reason why we have an increase in this country that these monies have not been used. However, I would agree with Dr. Brown on the other side of it that I don't think we should throw out uh, those programs that are working well and that have worked. Uh, in fact, if anything, maybe we ought to look at those programs to make them a model to uh, be used in those states that obviously have not used those monies correctly. Um, and with that, I might suggest that um, I, I am a little confused by the questioning on that since we've made it very clear over the last couple of weeks anyway that uh, we wanted to provide flexibility to the states and to the local governments to make those decisions. And in fact, in some cases, giving them uh, some much as 20, 25 percent discretionary dollars uh, in those dollars that are being block granted back to states. So, and I don't know that I've seen much in the legislation that has proven for that accountability. So I just might suggest to you that, that maybe we ought to look at that as we uh, pass these pieces of legislation. Um, I personally have been to some of these programs in, in fact, in the school system that my children are in and have walked uh, for drug-free society. Uh, have done those walks, have been with those students, and have found them to be very encouraging. Uh, in fact, it is the one time that I have seen a strong partnership uh, between our law enforcement, our school system, and our students, along with our teachers. Uh, I know the state of Florida has, in fact, used these funds, has distributed them to the local uh, school boards, and in our local school boards, we've actually had participation uh, on advisory councils uh, that was set up to move it from the state perspective and into our communities. Dr. Brown, maybe you can suggest to us, in fact, if that is happening in other parts of the country. And I would like to have an opportunity for you to talk a little bit more about some of those successful programs. But with one caveat, let me suggest to you that I was a teacher uh, for nine years uh, in the 70s. Um, seems like a long time ago, and I agree it probably was, when values clarification was the big issue. I haven't heard values clarification mentioned in a school curriculum for probably about even before I left the school system. So I would like, you know, maybe you to give us some ideas of the kinds of things that you're seeing out there that have been successful with our students and how we can continue if we were able to keep those funds to make those programs even more uh, a part of those communities and how we might bring partnerships in with our business communities who are in fact would be the reciprocants of vandalism, crime and everything else and how we can help with strengthening those. Your, your observation is correct. The funds go to more than just the drug education. It's the safe and drug-free schools program, so it also deals with crime. Let me just give you an example from randomly picked the state of New Hampshire, the Department of Education. Good choice. Is that like random <laughs> testing? <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, says funds are used for prevention, curriculum development, and instruction, after schools program, homework assistance for at-risk youth, teacher training and effective discipline practice, parent education programs, early intervention services for youth who are actively using alcohol, other drugs, tobacco, prevention campaigns, youth leadership, on and on. But the conclusion is that if funds are deleted, the above listed programs will end. There are simply no other funds available in our state for school-based prevention programs to ensure safe and drug-free schools. Uh, I can go on. There's a whole list throughout this country 
which would tell the same story, that these funds are used for curriculum development, teaching young people to de deal with conflict without resorting to violence, helping those who are using tobacco or alcohol or drugs, making sure that teachers are properly trained so that they can help the young people. And the, the irony of it is that if these programs are taken away, just as the, uh, the Department of Education in the state of New Hampshire has concluded if these funds are deleted, then these programs will end because states just simply do not have the money to carry them on. Uh, I visited, as I said before, many of these programs. I've seen firsthand how young people can get up and articulate ways whereby they will avoid using drugs based upon what they've seen. I've seen programs in schools where young people are conflict resolution monitors, uh, keeping problems from emerging in the schools by working with other people who are their peers. I've seen teachers who are very articulate in talking with their young people about the dangers of drug use. I've seen programs such as the D.A.R.E. program, funded in part, particularly their training program, material development, uh, that those police officers going into schools in uniform, in many places that may be the only positive role model those kids will have. And to deprive our children of that really has the potential of having a detrimental impact on the future of our country. That's why I feel so strongly about the deprivation that's taking place with the rescission funds of our Drug and Safe Free, Safe Free Schools program. They're making a difference. Uh, as I said before, it's the cornerstone of this nation's program to provide information to our K through 12th graders about the problems of drug, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, tobacco abuse. And it's very critical to our overall efforts to reduce those lines that we see in the charts that are going up. Dr. Brown, one of, one of the things when I was in the State Senate that I found so often, because we, we have limited funds, as, as we all do, and we all need to be very co conscious of that and, and make sure that our dollars are spent, but, but one of the things that has always um, sparked my interest or has given me concern has been the fact that so often we designate dollars to those that maybe have high crime areas and that's how those monies might be distributed for drug-free programs or whatever. Um, and in fact, what we end up doing is leaving those communities that have done a very good job in presenting their cases out there being left out of those formulas. Could that contribute at all to any increases where we actually have kind of let those that have done well uh, suffer because of other areas of, of high crime and forgetting that they are too or maybe that those programs have in fact worked? I think it would be a problem if those jurisdictions that have done a good job will be penalized for doing a good job. Uh, if I use an analogy, sometimes when I was working as a police officer, the police may do a, a very good job in one area of the city it, and crime rates down. Would not make good sense to take the police officers out of that neighborhood and then to see the crime rate go up. I think the same thing would be applicable here as well. I've seen throughout the country that some of our jurisdictions, particularly some of our small jurisdictions, that the school districts are pooling their money so they can take, take advantage of the um, resource, resources that are available to individual jurisdictions in a pool and purchase more resources to address the problem. But I don't think it would make sense to deprive a jurisdiction of funds because they are successful in achieving the objective. Which could happen it under could happen. what we're doing now. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Micah. <clears throat> Dr. Brown, I want to pick up uh, where I left off because uh, we'd established, I guess, uh, some, some facts in this uh, war on drugs that, in fact, that 99.44% uh, of the cocaine is coming from Colombia, Bolivia, and Peru. Um, you told me that uh, in your testimony, uh, didn't you say that we're, you think we're catching about 25% of the cocaine or did you say 33%? It's about a third of what's produced. I, I thought you said a third. That was kind of shocking to hear from, from you as the drugs are leading this uh, drug enforcement effort. When the Drug Enforcement Administration reports that 244,626 pounds of cocaine were seized nationwide by federal law enforcement agencies in 1993, the most recent year for which statistics are available. And the same officials estimate that only about 10% of the cocaine smuggled into the United States is seized. It seems to, that we have a little bit uh, different uh, 
difference of opinion there. Okay, so we're, we're, dealing, uh, we're dealing with three countries, and then we talked about Mexico, how more and more drugs are coming in through Mexico. In fact, when you testified before us last time, and correct me if I'm wrong, you said more than 70% of the cocaine entering the United States crosses the border with Mexico. Uh, and uh, let's see, of which increasing amount is smuggled in cargo containers. Uh, that, is that what you in fact testified that according, to, uh, uh, according to the statements we have from you for the last hearing? Would, would you repeat the question component there, please? Well, again, uh, you said, again, your, your quote is more than, quote, more than 70 percent of the cocaine entering the United States crosses the border with Mexico, of which increasing amount is smuggled in cargo containers, un, end quote. Yes, sir. Uh, words of, okay. Now, uh, so we, we've had a, a really disastrous policy with the people in South America. Uh, let, and, and I attended the Summit of Americas, and I'll get back to this in just a second. And, after the, and at the Summit of Americas, I met members of Congress, met with the President, the Vice President, I think Mr. Lake, several others, for almost an hour, and we talked about the, uh, about the problems uh, of giving information, uh, exchanging information, radar, and shoot-down policy, of which the President and Vice President and Mr. Lake uh, we're in some kind of a drug fog about each one of them gave us a different response. So I followed up uh, with what, comments sir? to to the uh, president citing the, the, the problems. Uh, in fact, sent him a copy of some of the comments from uh, some of the attendees. And let me read from President Fu Fujimura of, uh, of uh, Peru. Fujimura sailed U.S led efforts against cocaine, including providing funds to South American law enforcement agencies, promoting crop substitution and er eradication problem. I remind them, the hemispheric uh, leaders, that the anti-drug strategy has been a disaster. This is how he described uh, our policy, the president of Peru. Uh, are, are you aware of the, uh, of, again, one of these leading three countries uh, uh, saying uh, these remarks about our policy? Let me just um, go back to one of your previous questions about the seizures. I point out about a third or, or of the, the cocaine seized, that's worldwide. We, re we seize over a little over 100 metric tons in this country, but a third seized worldwide. When we talk to the leaders in other countries, they don't always share our perspective on the drug issue. Uh, many will tell us that what we have to do is deal with the consumption problem in America. Uh, our strategy addresses reducing the demand for drugs. Their observation is that the problem, from their perspective, exists in the United States. And thus, if there was no demand for the dr of drugs, there would be no supply for them. I think it, well, I'm not aware of the article you're reading well, from. The fact, the fact is that our policy relating to shoot down, sharing radar uh, information and other type of drug information was in total disarray, and they were dismayed by, uh, by a, a lack of policy in the United States. And the President of the United States, the Vice President, Mr. Lake, had no idea what was going on, I can assure you, because I was there and many other members uh, of Congress were there and talked to them. Okay, well, we've got cocaine coming in the country. We've done nothing as far as our policy, uh, and you've testified 70 percent's coming in through Mexico. We just bailed them out for $20 billion, and uh, there's no shred of evidence that you, as the leader of our drug effort, or the President of the United States, the leader of the country, had given any indication that this is a priority. We have no documentation that, uh, in, in any way, that y uh, you've done this. So, uh, okay, now it's coming in, so what are you doing to stop it? Uh, and, and you testified last time, 70 percent, and it's coming in through cargo containers. I have your uh, recommended budget from, uh, from uh, let's see, for 90, uh, 96. In 94, the actual amount of, of money for U.S. Customs, which, which is responsible for this, is uh, $572 million, and you recommend $500 million. Then I look at your policy over here relating to Container searches, the actual 1994 
is 227,827 estimated uh, uh, searches, and then it's down to 209,000 is your 96 pro projection. Your ship days go from, uh, again, searches is uh, 2,000, uh, uh, 268, and, and you're looking at, at doing 1,545. Well, we have no policy as far as making this an international policy, so the stuff is coming in, and uh, we, we see articles like this, border inspections eased and drug seizures plunged, so we're catching less drugs. I've got an article here in Tampa, from Tampa, heroin is here, and it's coming in through, uh, through uh, also through Mexico, we know. So you're uh, doing nothing as far as international leadership on the problem. It's coming in, and you're actually proposing that we reduce the areas that we can seize the stuff. Is that correct? Which part are you asking? Is the <laughs> are these figures John, correct? Uh, are you, are you actually uh, coming to, to the Congress that in the President's budget? Did he recommend less money for customs? And is part of your strategy to have a reduced number of container searches and uh, ship searches? Let me, you, you, you've, you've said a lot. That's why I asked the question, which one are you asking about? First of all, it's incorrect to say that our policy is in disarray. That's just not accurate, Mr. Congressman. You make allegations about the shoot-down policy. As I testified the last time I was before yeah. the subcommittee, the shoot-down policy is a product problem that was left over from the past administration, where there was a verbal understanding between the United States government and, and Peru and Colombia that they would not use the evidence that we shared with them to shoot down aircraft. Uh, they announced publicly that they were going to do that. Therefore, this administration had to address the problem because our lawyers advised that our personnel would be liable if they supplied information that was used to shoot down an airplane. So we came to the Congress and we got the problem resolved. The President asked the Congress to pass legislation which would give him... I think him that's in reverse. We went to the administration no, 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 that and said the just... policies in disarray because I participated myself in those hearings. Well, what your observation is certainly different than mine because I was the one who recommended to the President that he asked the Congress to change the law prior Don't... to the Congress was being involved whatsoever. I hate, to, I hate to move this on, but uh, we need the other side needs to have okay. an opportunity to share Just uh, one cheer final up question, Dr. Brown. You know, we have some problems here, but you are the leader, and we're looking to you for leadership and, and uh, some direction. So we're willing to work with you, but you have to come forward with some of these proposals and make this a priority, and, and, some, and some of these trade agreements and other things must be uh, tackled, and loan agreements, uh, you, you must be showing the leadership that these must be tied into this war on drugs or we're going to fail. Thank you, Mr. Well, Chairman. I, I appreciate you, your offer for assistance, and I will call on you for uh, your assistance. It's not helpful to make statements that I think are provocative that are not based on facts to say that the President does not know what's going on. Clearly the President knows what's going on in this issue. Congressman Condon. Uh, yes, I, I would like to, if I may, I uh, may disappoint uh, Dr. Brown, but I, I'd like to follow up on Mr. Micah's uh, where he's going on this. I, I'd like to ask you how much input do you have in the administration when it comes to foreign aid, foreign affairs, um, NAFTA, those kinds of things. Are you asked to come in and, and make any recommendations on how you might tie um, your interest and our interest in terms of drug interdiction into those policies? Frankly, I, I think Mr. Mike is on the right path it is that when we do foreign aid, when we do bail out to Mexico, it is a perfect time for us to demand reciprocal policies when it comes to drug uh, policy. It also is a perfect time for us to have prisoner exchange policies. When we, and we've not been able to do that, and frankly, I think we've missed uh, golden opportunities to, to force those governments to work a little closer with us. I think the questions that Mr. Uh, Micah is, is putting ought to be put to Mr. Cantor and, and people who do form trade. Um, and we did put those questions to him. And some of us who didn't support NAFTA didn't support it for some of these very reasons. We thought we ought to have uh, tied some of these policies with it. So um, uh, I want to be fair to you, uh, Dr. Brown. Uh, I mean, I don't know how much involvement you get with the administration when it comes to those policies, but maybe you can shed some light on that. As you know, my, my position is the 
drug policy advisor to the president, so I deal with the drug issue. The drug issue is obviously tied into many other things that we do, whether it's trade, commerce, or whatever. There is a relationship. But you have the State Department that deals with the negotiations with other countries, not my office. Right. And so when we talk about the, the funds going to Mexico, the State Department did address that as an issue. Your, your area offices and your national narcotics law enforcement offices, they worked on it, and the narcotics issue was a major element of concern. But the ultimate decision was, was not to link narcotics with this issue at that time, but to develop some understandings that the funds that, are, that were forthcoming from the United States government, that the understanding would be that they have to, to also address the drug problem. So it wasn't something that was neglected. It was addressed just in a different way. Were, were, you, um, were you asked to make a recommendation on how we might tie? Uh, I was not asked to make a recommendation, but we did have conversations with those who are in State Department that's addressing the issue. What would be the best uh, avenue for us as a, an oversight committee in this area to make the suggestion that we ought to couple these together when possible, that, that we missed a perfect opportunity and, and we ought to do it. Now, I, I understand that someone mm -hmm. somewhere made the decision not to couple uh, prisoner exchange and drug policy with the bailout of Mexico. And, and obviously, if you got the votes to do that, you do that. I frankly think it was unwise. I think you ought to always get something for in return uh, when you're w willing to give, go on a limb and, and bail people out, something that's of value to us and to them. Um, how, how best do we as a subcommittee address this issue of, of uh, foreign aid, mm -hmm. foreign policy uh, that I think, frankly, would help you and your task? Uh, well, well, first of all, it wasn't neglected. It was addressed. The decision was the understanding that Mexico would address the drug issue. I will take the message back. Uh, I, I'm hearing what you're saying. I, I will be uh, certainly willing to take the message back so it will be uh, conveyed appropriately. And, and, and do you, uh, do you uh, agree that, that this committee and members of Congress ought to continually uh, demand that this be a part of consideration? I mean, you may not agree with it, but it, it, that's probably the best way for us to... Well, well certainly I'm in favor of anything that's going to help us deal with the drug problem. Right. Uh, I think we have to tie to a lot of different things, so I would not be in disagreement with you. Pardon? Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, Mr. One, one quick question. Yes, I have a, uh, we're the Government Oversight Committee. Part of our responsibility is to do oversight. And I have one last travel question for you, and that is pursuant to the federal statute 31 U.S. Code 113A1 that you provide to the committee copies of the travel expense records maintained by the Office of the National Drug Control Strategy, including any records of your personal travel by any member of the office at taxpayer expense. I'll be glad to provide you whatever you want, but you, there's nothing I can provide you on personal travel at taxpayers' expense because I've nev never traveled personally on taxpayers' expense. You will, there's been nothing forthcoming on that because it's never happened. I'd like to add one other comment, and that is, is that I know uh, more specifically not of your New York experience, but of your Houston experience, and you were a national leader in identifying the harassment of drug dealers and people in the streets and really were aggressive in that and making it uncomfortable for people to deal drugs. And I'd like to see you, and that's partly what we're encouraging you to do, to bring that same forthright aggressiveness to this national problem that is increasing, push this administration, push every area. If they don't want to hear you in international relations, push them. You know, break some glass. Do what, what you've done. Don't let them uh, calm you down and say you can't do this. I know it's, it's difficult at times, but we want to back you up in that effort. Mr. Congressman, my problem is not the administration. My problem is with the Congress. If we ask for funds for programs and those funds are not forthcoming, then the agencies that are involved in our counter-narcotics efforts cannot carry out their work. If the Congress chooses to rescind to take back all the appropriated funds for our safe and drug-free schools programs, then how can we implement a program? If the Congress chooses to cut our interdiction budget by a half a billion dollars, how can we implement our policy? That's where I need your help, is helping us get the funds that the President's requesting for. Keep in mind that the President's requested a record $14.2 billion. 
Why are we requesting that? Because we recognize we have a very serious drug problem. If you want to be helpful, which I sincerely believe that you want to be helpful, then I would ask you to stand up and bang your hand on the table and ask for funds we will, to, we to will, allow us to carry out our national drug control strategy. And it isn't just a question of money, but we, this Congress has been here 90 days. It's not just a question of money and that I think you'll see some of those. It's also a question of international. It's a question of bully pulpit. It's a, it's a lot of different things, but money is part of it. And I uh, will work with you on well, that. Well, hopefully Thank the you, first Sutter. 90 days will Dr. not Brown. be uh, what we see in the future. Dr. Brown, I think uh, we're going to end this up on a uh, very strong note. Uh, when you and I met in my office, I told you that uh, we hopefully will use this as a, as a focus uh, to get the war back on track. Uh, you may feel that it's our fault that it's not on track. We may feel that it's the administration's fault. Uh, there's probably faults in both areas, and uh, some of this has been brought out very clearly today. Uh, since we had our first hearing, uh, we have heard from people all over the country, and it wasn't only with Mrs. Reagan's lead-off witness comments, certainly your comments. Uh, we have visited with people involving, involved in the drug war. I look forward to working with you and, and uh, traveling with you in either Baltimore or Philadelphia or someplace close by. Uh, so that we can become better acquainted with the challenges that you have before you. My commitment to you is, is that we are listening. Uh, we do have to get through the process of uh, um, whether the comments are real valid, uh, whether the questions got answered. One of the things I'd like to do, because some of the questions and the answers were not real clear, is submit to you a series of questions from both sides of the aisle, give you a chance to reflect on them, get some additional information, and get back to us. Uh, we are very serious in our focus. This is one of our major issues. It's not going to go away, and we'll continue to work on it. Uh, we've learned a lot. We need more. We need to learn more. Um, in the last hearing, you focused pretty much on treatment, and you on the 20 percent. We felt that we need to be focusing across the board uh, more effort in prevention, more effort in education, uh, as well as more effort in interdiction. Um, we also talked about the hope that we could get the President to be much more involved in terms of leadership. I hope and truly hope that that takes place. Um, we need to also do our role as well as individual members of Congress as we go back to our states, get the governors to do the same. We are going to have a meeting with uh, major CEOs across the country. I've talked to the Speaker about it. And we're going to have them in. We're going to talk about the drug war. We're going to talk about what can they do, what is their role. Uh, issues like drug testing, maybe it's something we need to address in the Congress, not only on staffs, but members of Congress. And um, if, if you have a Surgeon General that's talking about legalization and you have a drug problem in the White House, uh, and if we have a drug problem anywhere in the country, obviously that's going to deter and, and, and hurt the efforts that we're trying to make in terms of provide good leadership on the drug war. Um, I believe that, uh, and I guess one question I'd have, since our first hearing, have you talked to the President uh, in terms of uh, turning up the heat and putting it on more of on a front burner, using it as an item of discussion in, in Cabinet meetings, uh, doing it and supporting you, for, him, for example, uh, when you are aggressive in terms of our policy with Mexico and that bailout uh, to, to try to tie in some of your efforts? Anything taking place at all from our first hearing? I have regular conversations with the President on the drug issue. I think it's important to point out that the President understands the nature of the drug problem, probably more so than most people in this country. Uh, he has a feel for what needs to be done. He articulates what should be done. As you know, just recently the President invited the CEOs from the major entertainment and, and the communications industry to the White House, where he talked to them and in efforts to solicit their help and, and, be, and being a part of the solutions to the problem. The President recently cut a public service announcement for the Partnership for a Drug-Free America uh, talking to our young people about the problems of marijuana use. The President has been in the forefront in helping to address this issue and he will continue to be. He's committed to it. He recognizes that this is a major problem in his estimation, in my estimation, one of the more serious domestic problems confronting this country at this point in time. He is providing leadership. He speaks out on it all the time. One of his recent radio programs was addressed solely to the issue of the drug problem. 
So I am uh, encouraged, Mr. Chairman, that you are sincere about working with us to address this problem. And I look forward to following up on the, uh, the contacts made by my staff and your staff for us to go visit some sites to see firsthand what's going on. Including I think treatment by, sites. Uh, is, and we are going to do interdiction as well but, uh, and, and visits to source countries. Um, and, and I, I would like to uh, also, I think it was mentioned earlier, we need to go back to the governors. We need to go back to people involved that were responsible. Uh, for the safe and drug-free schools money, uh, if in fact that is as good as you have touted it and it needs to be put back in the budget, uh, that needs to be evaluated. Uh, if in fact uh, the abuses involved, as Mrs. Uh, Ross Layton indicated, um, we, we need to also take that in evaluation. But I think probably it needs to be better targeted, uh, more accountability put into it, uh, as is all the Federal programs. And I think the, the very valuable few dollars that we have chasing such great demand for, for those resources, we need to make sure that all of them take and score a direct hit. Uh, the only thing I would like to also add is that I just want to really appreciate uh, your uh, leadership and what you are trying to do. Uh, we would very much as a committee like to have the opportunity to informally meet with the President and talk about this issue. I don't know whether that is possible. Um, if we can do that, we, we would be honored to do that. Uh, again, the leadership must start. I think you seem to be the quarterback. Uh, you've got to get him to carry the ball as well as all of us to carry the ball. If we all get together, refocus this message and uh, you know, start putting the resources where they're going to do the most good, then hopefully we'll be able to win this drug war. I think it's probably the main, name, number one issue facing our country. Uh, it's something that, that I think we need to deal with in a different way than maybe it's been dealt, dealt with in the past. I agree with you about the seriousness of the problem. As the President has said on many occasions, we are not going to be able to have the things we want in this country, family and work and community, unless we can get a handle on the drug problem. I am also encouraged, Mr. Chair Mr. Chairman, by your clear understanding that this is not a Republican issue, not a Democratic issue. This is an American crisis that we have to work together to resolve. I am convinced, based on what I see throughout the nation, uh, with the many good things that are going on in this country, that by working together and focusing our efforts on the problem, that we will make a difference. Uh, and we must make a diff difference for the future of our country. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, just, I, I just need to, to comment just a little bit on this issue of trade, because I think that that, that is an issue that was a very bipartisan issue in trade. And to uh, paint the administration as being the only one who uh, raise this issue is absolutely untrue. Um, in fact, if I remember correctly, it was a pretty bipartisan vote with some of us voting against it because some of these issues were not taken care of. So I just, I, I want to be careful once again in the spirit of working in a bipartisanship that instead of pointing these fingers as we seem to be doing and focusing on the bailout when in fact it started back as far as the passage of NAFTA, that that should have been the time that the concern was. And the only t concern that I saw raised at that time was by Representative Clay Shaw. In fact, this committee held a hearing on that issue of a, of a man who had killed a, cons uh, a niece of a constituent and uh, that he wanted to hold his vote for that. Not once did I hear the issue raised on what is being raised today by either side, quite honestly. So to, in the spirit of all of this, I think we need to keep this in, co in, in a bipartisan cooperation. These are our children. These are our future. These are the natural resources that we have for this country to continue to be great. And I hope that we remember that through this uh, series of, of uh, hearings and opportunities we have to discuss with Dr. Brown in, and in making sure that we can come up with a policy that will work. Thank you. Thank you. The chair will keep the record open for one week for all members and for Dr. Brown if you have additional information you want to submit. Uh, I want to thank you on behalf of the committee uh, for your patience. Uh, you've been here longer than we estimated and you've been very patient under uh, some tough examining, including from myself, and I, I do believe it's important on this type of issue that we have bipartisan leadership, and we look forward to working with you and appreciate your cooperation. Uh, with this, the chair will adjourn the meeting. Thank did you. Did you have a closing comment? Your Go ahead. In this problem. I look forward to working with you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Meeting is adjourned.